This just in, the world's oldest pyramid was built during the last ice age. And I'm not even talking about Egypt. I'm saying our ancestors might have spewed a 27,000-year-old pyramid in West Java. Ganung Padang is not exactly shouting pyramid. It's more of a mound with huge scattered stones tossed all over it. But local people seem to revere it, and they have for centuries. It wasn't until recently that the Indonesian authorities decided to excavate a bit deeper to see what all the fuss was about. They ended up finding the remains of a human settlement. It was rather unexpected, since the mound is pretty high up. This excavation could only prove there were humans in the area as far back as 45 BCE, which sounds reasonable. It was up to an Indonesian geologist named Donnie Hillman to prove that Ganung Padang is the world's first pyramid. He used all sorts of new technology to support his claim. Our guy used carbon dating, which digs deep into the earth and takes whole chunks of soil. He found layers and layers of constructions, like he was digging up Rome and finding ancient buildings buried in the ground. His research proved that there had been caverns and even rooms down there, which could only mean one thing – humans. As for the rocks located up in the mound, they were most likely strategically placed by the people who lived there back in the day. They needed a place to meditate, so they arranged things in a harmonious way. Their smooth surfaces wouldn't be the result of years of erosion, but the works of great sculptures, the Michelangelos of their day, let's say. If this is all for real, then human civilizations began way, way before we think they did. Our ancestors, the Paleolithic humans, didn't have what it took to be considered a civilization especially not the tools and knowledge to build pyramids. They needed a lot of masonry skills, which weren't all that available during the last ice age. His peers don't share this view, though. They could believe Hillman's theory if he had found evidence such as charcoal and bone fragments, but he didn't. Flint Dibble, another archaeologist, says that without concrete evidence of human activity, there's no proof of an actual pyramid. In this case, all the data proves is that the soil in the mound dates back to 27,000 years ago. He thinks the rocks on top of the mound just slip down the hill, like rocks normally do. Only a complex society would have managed to build a stepped pyramid like they claim it was. But according to Bill Farley, an American archaeologist, there's just no reason to believe there were any settlements in Indonesia during the last ice age. Now, just so you know, the oldest known ancient society with this kind of knowledge is probably 11,000 years old and used to occupy the region of modern-day Turkey. Take a look, Turkey's Gobekli Tepe. It's also not a pyramid, but it's the oldest monolithic construction made by humans. Back in the Neolithic period, a lot of people settled there, and there are proofs for it. For example, the walls there are covered in ancient drawings of clothing and wild animals. Until recently, the title of the world's oldest pyramid went to a three-sided construction known as the Djoser Pyramid in Egypt. Djoser is located just a few miles south of the Giza complex in a town called Saqqara. It made its way to popular culture more than once. In the 18th century, it became a common feature in European paintings. Young men from the cultural elite did a grand tour around the world, and Saqqara was at the top of their list. It was also featured in the video game Assassin's Creed, with a digital representation way more accurate than many historical drawings of the thing. That was kind of a big deal in ancient Egypt, to build pyramids for kings to spend their afterlives. And if you thought the Khufu pyramid was the oldest one in the world, well, Djoser was built 70 years ahead of that time. The development of new technology has allowed archaeologists to make groundbreaking discoveries, and a new, or should I say ancient, pyramid in South America might win the title in dispute. It turns out that pyramids were also pretty fashionable in the Americas in the old days. Among them are the iconic pyramids of Guatemala's Tikal Temple Complex, the same ones that appeared in Star Wars No. 4. But to find the oldest pyramid in the Americas, one would have to travel to Peru. Deep in the Peruvian desert, archaeologists stumbled upon a sprawling ancient metropolis known as Corral. At first, researchers believed that the settlement was pretty recent, since the site was way too complex for ancient technology to handle it. As we said, Corral is a desert town, like Las Vegas, but without all the hoopla. This means no easy access to water. And for cities like these to thrive, 
they need a considerable irrigation system, which leads us back to complex technologies. The Peruvians surprised us all with this new discovery. This site was huge, filled with an amphitheater, houses, and religious buildings. The whole thing probably sprawled through 370 acres. And when scientists went to test their initial hypothesis using radiocarbon dating, they found that the city probably sprung around 2027 BCE. On the site, archaeologists found six pyramids that could possibly predate the one in Saqqara. As far as they know, both civilizations coexisted in the same time period, in opposite parts of the world. But since researchers can't pinpoint the exact age of Corral's pyramids, it's pretty hard to guess which civilization completed their pyramid first. Hmm, if only we had a crystal ball. Now, it just so happens that the shape of a pyramid is something that nature is able to produce all on its own, leaving us modern-day humans a bit confused. A classic example is the Japanese side of Yaonagani, which also goes by the name of Japan's Atlantis. The entire monument is about the size of five football fields and the height of a five-story building. Explorers and scientists believe that Yanagani dates back to 10,000 years ago. For Japan's top marine geologist, Professor Mizaki Kumura, Yanagani is the heritage of a lost civilization. Kumura has dived into exploring the ruins over a hundred times over the past 10 years. To him, there are clear signs of human activity down there. Check out this triangular-shaped pool on the monument's surface. Kimura thinks it's actual proof of humans, because this triangle-shaped concave is a historical symbol of water fountains in the region. As it happens with a lot of these cases, not all scientists are convinced the same. For many, Yonagani is probably the result of thousands of years of erosion. And the fact that the monument is composed of one massive rock leads them to believe it is not really human-made. Sure, these huge basalt columns may look like the ruins of a palace, but they're most likely the result of the intense volcanic activity in the region. And speaking of natural formations that really look like a human made it, a pyramid on Mars has been a hot topic lately. Humans have been keenly trying to prove that there is life on Mars for quite some time. But some are stretching it really far, saying that little green or gray people built a pyramid on the planet to try and build their own civilization. This picture was taken over a decade ago by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the MRO. But it started to resurface recently. It shows what looks like a three-sided pyramid. Some people claim that the smooth side of the pyramid could only be the effect of otherworldly work. Mm. Then science comes along and explains that Mars is home to one of the deepest canyon systems in the whole solar system. The so-called pyramid is located in what is known as the Kandor Chasma region. This Martian region has a bunch of similar formations that are nothing more than the result of erosion. Nothing supernatural going on there, apparently. The story goes that two Mayan twin boys loved to play ball. Sure, they were really good at it, but they also made a lot of noise when playing. The lords of the underworld soon became bothered by the sound and summoned the two boys to the underworld, a place the Mayans called Xibalba. As soon as the boys reached their gloomy destination, the lords of the underworld began putting them through a series of tests. Soon enough, the inexperienced twin boys failed the tests and lost their lives. But this was not in vain. This sad event resulted in the appearance of a beautiful fruit tree. Soon enough, a young woman saw a beautiful fruit on this tree and reached up to pick it. Legend has it that soon after that, she gave birth to another set of twin boys named Hunapu and Jibalanqui. Just like their ancestors, these twins were great ball players, But they were equally as loud, and the lords of the underworld became annoyed again. They decided to ask this pair of twins to come to play a game in the underworld hoping to get rid of them, too. When the twins arrived, the Lord sent them through a number of frightening places. The first one was the House of Gloom, which was very dark. They then passed through the House of Knives, where they had to avoid getting injured. The twins then built a fire in the House of Cold, so that they didn't freeze, and ran through the House of Jaguars, where they tricked the animals into not eating them. Finally, they entered the House of Bats, where they seemed to have lost their luck. 
one of the bats managed to run off with Hunapu's head. The lords then challenged the twins to play ball with them, but the boys were clearly at a disadvantage. Jibalanqui placed a turtle on Hunapu's shoulders to make up for his lost head, and they began playing. As the lords became distracted by an animal near the court, Jibalanqui stole his brother's head and placed it back in its place. Much to the annoyance of the lords, the twins were now able to tie the game. Hunapu and Jibalanqui continued to perform a series of tricks for the lords of the underworld. One of them involved Jibalanqui injuring Hunapu and then bringing him back to life. The lords were so impressed by the twins' performance that they asked them to do the same trick on them. Of course, the twins agreed, but after performing their trick on some of the lords, they refused to revive them. Seeing what had happened, the lords of the underworld admitted defeat and begged for their lives, promising not to intervene in the lives of people ever again. Hunapu and Jibalakwi were happy to have avenged their ancestors and gained the respect of the lords. Legend has it that the lords of heaven were so impressed by the twins that they took them to live in the sky by turning them into the moon and the sun. The Maya civilization was one of the most dominant indigenous societies in history, and their folklore and traditions are still discovered and studied today. They used to live in a territory called Mesoamerica. It was made up of modern-day Mexico and parts of Central America like Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, Yucatan Peninsula, and El Salvador. They lived from 1800 to 900 BCE and up to 900 to 1500 CE. Apart from their impressive legends, the Maya were very skilled inventors. They're known for their calendars, writing systems, farming methods, and sports. Their writing, for example, was found preserved on buildings and stone monuments, as well as in rare books and pottery. It's a system made out of more than 800 hieroglyphics in various combinations. Each of those signs was said to represent a syllable. Their writing system was deciphered by accident by Tatyana Proskoryakov, an American woman who initially studied to be an architect. Since she didn't find a job in her field, she eventually became a Mayanist in her own right, despite not being academically trained. She was the first to notice that the Mayan upended frog glyph meant birth and that their toothache glyph meant the date when the king ascended to the throne. It made it easier for scientists to pinpoint birthdays as well as the names of the rulers of a specific Mayan dynasty. They also invented the concept of zero, which is seen as one of the greatest innovations in mathematics, physics, and human history altogether. Sure, even back then, people understood the idea of having nothing, but the concept of zero as a number is a relatively new invention. A fun fact about Mayans is that they really liked hats. The bigger your hat was, the more important you looked. Not only was it a sort of fashion statement, but it also made them look taller, which was a big deal for their aesthetic. The Mayans also came up with one of the most intricate and complex calendars in human history. It was the first to use zero as a placeholder. Their calendar ended on December 21st, 2012, which led some people to believe that it translated to the end of the world. Obviously, that was not the case. It just so happened that the date coincided with the end of a Mayan cycle of years. But you know, as advanced in science and astronomy as they were, they did make some mistakes. One of them was their belief that the world was flat. Their theory was that the four corners of the world were watched by the brother lords, who kept the sky from falling over their lands. Hats off for their menus, though, as they were well-known chocolate eaters. They turned eating chocolate into a form of art. The drink they made wasn't really like the hot chocolate we enjoy today, though. The recipe included mixing cacao with water, honey, chili pepper, cornmeal, and other ingredients to make a foamy, spicy drink. The ritual of drinking cacao was a crucial part of their celebrations. We're not done discovering all the amazing parts of their architecture and civilization. It was only a few years ago that a Maya pyramid was found at Tonina, in the Mexican state of Chiapas. It was estimated to be more than a thousand years old. 
The reason why it escaped archaeologists for so long was that it lay hidden under what was believed to be a natural hill. The ruins of two Mayan cities have been recently discovered in the Mexican state of Campeche. Why didn't we find them until now? Well, they were concealed by really thick vegetation, which made it difficult for archaeologists to reach them. The Mayans didn't just disappear. Their descendants are still around today, many of them choosing to live in their ancestral homelands. You can find them in Guatemala, for example, where the Maya people make up the majority of the population. Overall, the Maya ethnic group contains people that speak different Mayan languages, such as Yucatec, Quiche, Quechi, or Mopan. They had no idea what a spa day was, but the Mayans really enjoyed a nice sweat once in a while. Sweat lodges were discovered around ancient Mayan sites. They were built out of stone or adobe. These rooms were an essential part of their cleansing and healthcare rituals. One of the earliest sweat lodges was found in Quello in northern Belize and appeared to date back 3,000 years. One of the most important parts of the Mayan culture was a ball game which they named Pips. It had both political and spiritual significance. We can see ball courts at important parts of Mayan archaeological sites. The main goal of the game was to pass a rubber ball through a very high stone hoop without using your hands. Basically, it was a combination of soccer and basketball. However, it could have serious consequences. The loser could, at times, even lose his own life. Ooh, high stakes indeed! Because of this game and the need for bouncy balls, the Mayan people were some of the first cultures to use rubber. They made it using natural latex. There were different kinds of rubber depending on what natural substances the latex was mixed with. And that, my friend, is the way the ball bounces. Sorry, but you know me, I just couldn't resist. Before we get into the reason why and how there are pyramids all around the world, let's talk about some of the examples. I'll start with the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico. These folks really knew how to build a city. Their well-planned urban center spanned over seven square miles and boasted several pyramids. But the Pyramid of the Sun is the most impressive. This giant pyramid was built way back in 100 CE and is one of the biggest structures of its kind in the whole Western Hemisphere. It's so big that it's 216 feet high above the ground. If you ever find yourself in this ancient city, you won't be able to miss the Pyramid of the Sun. It's right there on the east side of the Avenue of the Dead, the city's main north-south street. To build this incredible pyramid, around 1 million cubic yards of material were used, including a special kind of red volcanic rock called Hue Tezontal. Impressive, huh? We don't know too much about the people who built the Pyramid of the Sun or its purpose. But archaeologists believe there was once a temple on top of it. When explorers went below the pyramid in the 1970s, they found a bunch of cool tunnels and chambers. In 2011, they even found a secret stash of clay pots, obsidian pieces, animal bones, human figurines, and a mask. Who knows what other secrets the pyramid is hiding? If you decide to see this one, you must climb the pyramid using the 248 uneven steps on the west side. Watch your step! Sudan got some pyramids too. Nubian pyramids aren't as big as the ones in Egypt, but they still got around 200 of them. These ancient pyramids have been home to the tombs of the pharaohs of the Meroitic Kingdom for almost a thousand years, who ruled Egypt from Nubia to the Mediterranean Sea. The pyramids at Meroe were constructed using granite and reddish sandstone. Oh, and did you know that Sudan has more ancient pyramids than Egypt? The Kushite pyramids depict the indigenous architecture and burial traditions of Nubia's Napata and Meroe kingdoms, which ancient Egypt influenced. Meroe, the burial site of over 40 queens and kings, is the most extensive Nubian pyramid site. 
The tomb walls depict mummified royals bedecked in jewelry, their wooden caskets containing bows, quivers of arrows, and other artifacts pointing to the Meroitic relationship and trade with Egyptian and Greek civilizations. So if you're looking for some ancient tombs to explore, you may consider skipping the crowds in Egypt and heading on down to Sudan. Let's fly to Iraq to see some more pyramids. Ziggurats have fancy receding layers and tiered temples. Instead of a smooth exterior, it has tiers like a cake, perfect for all the important work and rituals that went on inside. You can find these towering structures scattered throughout Iraq and Iran and they're a real testament to the power and skills of the people who built them. One of the biggest and most impressive ziggurats is the Ziggurat at Ur. It's basically a giant rectangular pyramid that stands a whopping 70 to 100 feet tall, with three levels of terraces and a temple on top. Can you imagine how many baked bricks it took to build that thing? Try 720,000 for just the lower portion. This particular ziggurat was built for Sumerian king Ur-Nammu. Similar to other ones, this pyramid has been around for thousands of years. So it got a little rough around the edges. Thankfully, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II and some archaeologists came to the rescue in the 6th and 20th centuries respectively. And now you can find this near Talil Air Base. The ziggurat at Ur was built in 2100 BCE by King Ur-Nammu for the moon deity Nana. It was the tallest building in the city and you could see it from miles around. It was like the medieval cathedral spire of its day. People would come here to bring their agricultural surplus and get their food allotments and seek spiritual nourishment. Sadly, the Nana temple at the top of the ziggurat didn't survive but we do have some blue glazed bricks that may have been part of its decoration. The lower parts of the ziggurat are pretty amazing though. The architects even included holes in the temple's baked exterior to let the water evaporate from its core. Since we explored some of the pyramids on our planet, let's take a broader perspective. They can be found in many parts of the world. Egypt has over 100 pyramids double that number in Sudan, and dozens of others are scattered in the Middle East and China. The Americas have the most pyramids in total, with more pyramids than the rest of the world combined. These pyramids are located in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Time to know more about the evolution of pyramids through history. The oldest pyramid is in Egypt. This pyramid was a step pyramid, which was created by placing one layer of stone on top of another. The pharaoh Sneferu is credited with creating the pyramid shape we recognize today. During his 45-year reign, he built three pyramids. His first two attempts failed, but he finally got it right with the Red Pyramid, which is considered the first true pyramid. It was Sneferu's son, Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid of Giza, which was the tallest human-made structure on Earth for almost 4,000 years. Latin American pyramids are similar to early Egyptian steppe pyramids, but they were built independently with no knowledge of each other. The pyramids in Sudan were built around 700 BCE and are tall but much narrower than those in Egypt. How in the world did all these civilizations build these things without even texting each other? After all, the Aztecs, Mayans, and ancient Egyptians were about as different as possible. But despite their cultural differences, they all seem to agree on one thing. Pyramids were pretty cool. Step pyramids are all around the world because they were the most feasible and stable way to build large and tall structures without access to lighter building materials like wood and metal. The triangular form with a square base is the best way to build a sturdy structure, and having a cube structure would require more material for less height. Now, when it comes to pyramid design, the Egyptian pyramids were like giant triangles with a square base, smooth sides, and a pointy top. 
On the other hand, the Aztecs and Mayans went for a tiered cake look, with steps leading up to a flat platform on top. So, while all these pyramids share the same basic shape, they have their own unique flair. Each group built its pyramids using different materials, techniques, and slope angles. So while they may have been inspired by each other's work occasionally, they were just doing their own thing. Egyptian pyramids had smooth, angled sides that were designed to help the pharaoh's soul ascend to heaven. The Pyramid of the Sun was built over a series of caves that served as a passageway for the deities. The Maya built the temple of Kukulkan in Chichen Itza to honor the deity Kukulkan, usually represented by a serpent. Nicknamed El Castillo, it has 91 steps on each side, plus a platform. That's 365 steps, one for each day of the Mayan calendar. Tell me, Brightsiders, how were pyramids built? To begin with, humans made them, not a foreign race from space that landed on Earth. You see, one thing that all pyramids have in common is that they were built without advanced tools or even the wheel. It took a lot of people to build them, including skilled laborers and architects. For example, it's estimated that 20,000 people built the Great Pyramid of Giza, and it's believed that most of them were skilled laborers. Building pyramids was a massive undertaking that required years of planning and effort. The Great Pyramid at Cholula, Mexico took 600 years to complete. Consider the Great Pyramids, one of the original seven wonders of the world and the only one that still exists today. Did you know that the Pyramids of Giza weren't the only pyramids out there? And they weren't even the first ones. First, there were the pretty good pyramids, but they didn't catch on. Nah, I made that up. <laughs> Back to the story. In ancient Egypt, it was believed that kings were chosen by gods to serve on Earth as their mediators. In the afterlife, they were expected to become gods themselves. The pyramid complex was built to make sure that the king had everything they might need in the afterlife. The complex included the pyramid, a palace, and temples. The tomb in the pyramid, where the king was buried, was filled with many things they might need, like furniture, food, and gold vessels. Actually, the first pyramid had been built 80 years before the first pyramid of Giza appeared. Overall, there were around 100 of them. Some weren't finished, though, since the construction took a while and not every pharaoh lived long enough to see the end of the construction. And now, let's talk about the construction itself. The biggest of the pyramids of Giza is as tall as a 40-story building. So how on earth did they manage to build a structure that massive 5,000 years ago, long before machines and other equipment appeared? Well, let's figure it out. So Pharaoh Khufu ascended the throne around 2575 BCE, and his architects started the construction of the oldest and biggest of the pyramids of Giza. He figured that over 2 million limestone blocks had to be used to build the pyramid, each weighing around 2.5 tons, around the weight of a rhino. The architect wanted to finish the construction in 20 years. To make it possible, a stone had to be carried and pushed into place every 4 minutes, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and 365 days a year, except leap year. So obviously, a lot of workers were needed to make it happen. Many believe that it was enslaved people who worked at the pyramid's construction site. But that's not true. Workers came from all over Egypt to contribute to the project. All in all, around 25,000 of them. The Egyptians were doing all kinds of work, starting with manual labor and crafting tools, to administrative work. They all worked around 10 hours a day. They were housed and well-fed, and they were overall living a more comfortable life than an average Egyptian could afford at that time. Supposedly, the builders lived in a nearby temporary city and were a highly organized community with a strong leader. The pyramids seemed to be designed to align with the points on a compass, and their sides symbolized the rays of the sun. But back at that time, there were no compasses. Ancient Egyptians figured out the directions themselves and with amazing precision. To align the pyramids, they used two constellations. The construction site was arranged on the west bank of the Nile River. This also had a symbolic meaning. 
Just like the sun sets in the west, life sets in the west as well. The second pyramid of Giza was for Khufu's son, Pharaoh Khafre. It's a bit smaller, but this one has the famous noseless statue of the Sphinx. Of course, originally, it had a nose. I would tell you what happened to it, but it's still a mystery, and no one knows for sure. <laughs> Sphinxes have the body of a lion and the head of a human. They were considered guardians of important areas. This famous sphinx, also pronounced sphinx, has the head of Pharaoh Khafre and is guarding his pyramid, facing the sunrise. The sphinx is one of the biggest and oldest statues in the world. Originally, it not only had a nose, but was also painted. Scientists have discovered traces of the red color of its face. So, most likely, the sphinx was painted red. There are also remains of yellow and blue color on its body. The statue definitely wasn't boring. Till around 1800, the Sphinx was buried up to its shoulders until an adventurer with a team of 160 men dug it out. But let's get back to the construction. The workers, of course, needed stone blocks. There were two main places where people could get these stones. One source was close to the construction site. But that fossil-lined yellow stone was only suitable for the pyramid's interior. The limestone blocks for the exterior were hauled from 8 miles away on 30-foot-long sleds. Apparently, it wasn't too hard to pull them. The sand mixed with the right amount of water was pretty slick, and 10 people could move a sled even with a rock weighing so much. Surprisingly, cutting off a block of limestone wasn't the biggest problem, when in the ground, it was soft and could be split relatively easy. But after getting exposed to the air, limestone hardens. So the most difficult part was to shape the blocks. That step was crucial, because the smallest inaccuracies could lead to the whole pyramid collapsing. So, okay, those limestones were mined, carried on a sled, shaped, and then what? How could they be put into place? Well, this is still a mystery. Archaeologists have discovered the remains of a ramp system that dates back around the time the pyramids were being built. So historians have come to the consensus that, most likely, the Egyptians designed a unique ramp system to move and pull huge stone blocks. The most common opinion is that there were several ramps around the pyramid. There probably was a central ramp with two staircases on each side of it built over the pyramid stones. The ramp was growing as the pyramid was getting higher. People might have been walking up the stairs, pulling up stones on wooden sleds. But this is just one of the options. Other experts say that the ramps were around the pyramid. And some say that the ramps were inside the pyramid. Maybe we will never know for sure, and it'll forever remain a mystery. The exterior limestone of the pyramid was polished with sand and stone until it gleamed. On top, there was a gold and silver capstone, which glimmered over Egypt like a second sun. So that's how it was 5,000 years ago. Now, about the interior. Surprisingly, there's not much inside the pyramid. Most of it is just solid stone with very little open space. But let's take a quick look inside. From the entrance, there are two stairways, one going down and the other going up. They take us to the chambers. There are three of them inside. Now why is that? Apparently, throughout the whole construction, a burial chamber had to be prepared at all times, just in case a pharaoh kicked the bucket before the construction ended. So separate chambers were built one after another as the construction progressed. The last of them was the main one. It's called the King's Chamber. It's the one where Khufu was resting. It's the biggest room at the very heart of the pyramid, and there's a big passageway leading to it. It was likely used as a kind of elevator to move granite up to build the interior. Granite was also used to make five stories of support beams to ensure that the pyramid didn't collapse. And we can see that it worked since it's been standing for centuries. Unfortunately, none of these chambers have hieroglyphs on the walls. If you want to see the writings, you should go to the decorated tombs near the pyramids. Those pieces of art are depiction of ancient Egypt's culture and daily life. The texts allow researchers to study their language and grammar. The treasures that once were in the pyramids have been taken by people. There are also many secret tunnels and passages inside the pyramids. But even today, 
no one knows the whole plan of the interior. Scientists have been sending little robots with cameras inside for many years, but there's still a lot we don't know about the pyramids. Now they're trying to use an X-ray to scan the pyramids from the outside, without going inside. So yeah, ancient Egyptians did create a mystery no one has been able to crack for 5,000 years already. And now we're off to almost 5,000 years ago. Let me take you to ancient Egypt, where back in 2550 BC, guess what? The construction of the Great Pyramids of Giza started. People learned to build cathedrals and skyscrapers, but it wasn't until recently that these massive buildings appeared. It's still a mystery to even modern scientists how these pyramids were built 5,000 years ago. No wonder they are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They're also the oldest of them and the only wonder of the ancient world that still exists in the 21st century. It must have taken a lot of cooperation to build a thing that massive, even for today's metrics. But the Giza pyramids weren't the first pyramids ever. The first one, called the Step Pyramid, was built around 80 years before the first pyramid of Giza, in 2630 BC, for King Djoser. It wasn't meant to be extraordinary, but ended up being quite impressive. It was a pyramid of six stepped layers of stone. It was 204 feet high, which is as tall as a 19-story building. And it was the tallest building that existed at that time. It wasn't just a pyramid, though. It was surrounded by a whole complex of buildings, including even courtyards. In ancient Egypt, people believed in the afterlife. So everyone, especially kings, wanted to make sure they had everything they needed to get ready for it. Here's why the pyramid complex was perfectly supplied with a lot of objects people used every day. The complex included a pyramid and a kind of a palace. Those buildings had many things the king loved and might need one day, like furniture, food, and gold vessels. After Djoser, building pyramids became common practice, but many pyramids weren't finished. It would usually take about 20 years to build one, but many rulers reigned way less than that. Overall, there are more than 100 pyramids. The most famous pyramids are the Great Pyramids of Giza. The first one and the biggest one was built for Pharaoh Khufu, around 2550 BC. Initially, it was 481 feet tall, which is as tall as a 40-story building. The second pyramid was built for Khufu's son, Pharaoh Khafre, around 2520 BC. It's just a bit shorter, usually standing at 471 feet high a 39-story building. This is the pyramid with the famous statue of the Sphinx. Sphinxes have a lion's body and a human head. They were built to guard important areas. This one has the head of Pharaoh Khafre and is guarding his pyramid, facing the sunrise. The Sphinx is most well-known and is one of the world's biggest and oldest statues. Originally, it had red color and did have a nose. It's still possible to see the trace of red pigment by its ears. But no one knows exactly when the nose disappeared. For some time, the Sphinx was sort of hidden underground, being covered with sand up to its shoulders. Luckily, in the early 1800s, an adventurer with a team of 160 people dug it out. The third pyramid of Giza is the smallest one, being more than twice shorter. Originally, it was 218 feet high, about the height of a 20-story building. Built in 2490 BC, it was a pyramid for Khafre's son, Menkar. The pyramids are designed to align with the points of the compass, and their sides symbolize the rays of the sun. But back at the time, there were no compasses. Ancient Egyptians figured out the directions themselves, and with amazing precision. To align the pyramids, they used two constellations. Originally, the pyramids were covered in smooth white limestone and had a gold-silver top to reflect the sun. Later, the white limestone was taken from the pyramids by other kings and used for other buildings. Scientists estimated that ancient Egyptians used about 2.3 million stone blocks to build the first pyramid. Each block weighed more than one ton. This is the weight of a rhino. Some blocks were even bigger, being almost as heavy as an elephant. Four and a half millennium ago, there was no modern equipment to help build it. There were no machines, no wheels, and even no steel. The only metal available to them was copper. Even today, scientists aren't sure how the Egyptians managed to build the pyramids. There are no records left that would shed light on it. 
Some even think that Egyptians wanted to keep it as their secret and didn't even record it on purpose. Many believe that poor people and foreigners built the pyramids, but it's not true. Actually, the builders were very skilled workers, and they were fed and paid well. The archaeologists claim that the builders lived in a nearby temporary city and were a highly organized community with a strong leader. Scientists say that around 20,000 people worked on each pyramid complex, and it took about 20 years to build each. It probably was a national project. The construction site was large in resources, and food and essentials were likely to be contributed from all parts of Egypt. Even with all that support, it remains unclear how people managed to cut, transport, and assemble those huge stones. One of the theories suggests the stones were most likely transported on boats down the Nile River. Then, there was a harder part. They had to be moved to the construction site. For that, they probably used wooden sleds. It wasn't very hard to pull them because the sand mixed with the right amount of water was pretty slick. And 10 people could move a sled even with a rock weighing one ton pretty easily. Finally, one last problem. The stones had to be lifted and put into place. Archaeologists have discovered the remains of the ramps system that dates back to when the pyramids were built. Most likely, the Egyptians designed a unique system to move and pull huge stone blocks. But no one knows what it looked like exactly. The most common opinion is that there were several ramps around the pyramid to help move the blocks. The ramp was growing, with the pyramid getting higher. They suppose people were walking up the stairs, pulling the stone on the wooden sled up in the middle on the sandy ramp. But this is just one of the options. Others say that the ramps were going around the pyramid. Some say the ramps were inside the pyramid. But we'll never know for sure, and it'll forever remain a mystery, just like the ancient Egyptians wanted. Surprisingly, there's not much inside the pyramids. Most of it is just solid stone with very little open space. But let's take a quick look inside the biggest of the pyramids of Giza. From the entrance, there are two stairs, one going down and the other one going up. The descending one takes you to a chamber located underground. That's where the pharaohs are, but not in this pyramid because Khufu wanted to stay higher. The underground room is partly unfinished. The room with Khufu's sarcophagus is called the King's Chamber. It's upstairs and then through the tall and long Grand Gallery. Below the King's Chamber, there's a room called the Queen's Chamber. There are no queens though, and no one is sure why the room is called this. Unfortunately, none of these have any hieroglyphs on the wall. They're just bare. If you want to see them, you should go to the other rooms that are decorated. Those pieces of art are depictions of ancient Egypt's culture and daily life. The texts allow researchers to study their language and grammar. Sadly, the treasures that once were here in the pyramid are long stolen. From that room, there are several tunnels for an unknown purpose. There are many tunnels and passages inside the pyramids. There are many chambers and shafts and secret ways. Scientists have been sending little robots with cameras there for some decades already. And the robots did discover another chamber a bit upstairs with hieroglyphs on the walls. But even today, much of the pyramids is still unknown and there's no so-called building plan of the pyramids. Egyptians did create a mystery no one can crack for 4,500 years already. Scientists recently started to x-ray the pyramid to learn what's inside it without entering it and its narrow, mysterious tunnels. Imagine working seven days a week on a large-scale construction site. You, along with thousands of others, carry millions of stone blocks and put them on top of each other according to a complex system. You work without modern construction equipment. You have no air conditioning or constant access to water. It's so hot outside that you can fry eggs on the road. You've been building the pyramid for decades. And now, when it's finally done, you enjoy the result of the colossal work of thousands of people. You're looking at a giant cultural monument of global value that will freeze in time and amaze people for tens of thousands of years. A few thousand years have passed. People in the 21st century see the pyramids and are like, wow, I can't believe humans have built this. Yeah, the people who built the pyramids wouldn't have appreciated such a theory. But actually, there are reasons to believe that people built it using some fantastic technology. 
From the outside, it seems the Great Pyramids are just big triangles of stone. People just put some heavy blocks on top of each other, and that's it. In fact, the design seems too perfect to be true. The pyramid consists of more than two million blocks. They lay so close to each other and are so even that you couldn't squeeze even a thin sheet of paper between them. Scientists still can't figure out the exact technology for building the Egyptian pyramids. One of the biggest and most famous is the Great Pyramid of Giza. This huge construction, well known all over the world, has one big secret. There should be a capstone on top of the pyramid. It's a triangular shaped stone block, a small pyramid on top of a huge one. It's also called a pyramidion. The builders of ancient Egypt made it out of granite and limestone and covered it with gold. No records or old drawings prove that there was a pyramidion at the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza. But there's another ancient Egyptian structure with such a triangle, the Red Pyramid. It was built before the Great One, and its capstone has survived to this day. Archaeologists have found and reconstructed it. But where could the capstone of the Great Pyramid be? It's a mystery that still has no answer. Some are sure that some thieves have stolen it from the top. Maybe they just climbed up and pushed the Pyramidion down. It makes perfect sense. The capstone was probably the most valuable element of the pyramid. Many scientists and archaeologists still don't know its exact purpose. Some believe that this peak covered with gold glorified the pharaohs. The capstone reflected moonlight at night and illuminated the entire space around it. During the day, the capstone reflected sunlight with its shiny surface. You could have noticed it from afar. The top of the pyramid was a kind of guiding star for lost travelers. All other stone blocks of the pyramid consist of limestone. People polish them to make them look shiny. In the past, they were even glowing and reflected light. You could see glowing pyramids from space, although they looked like tiny lights. Over thousands of years, winds, sandstorms, and rains have changed the pyramid's appearance. If people had taken care of them all this time, they would have looked like something out of science fiction movies or the pyramids from Las Vegas. But unfortunately, we will never see their original appearance. Some archaeologists and scientists believe that the capstone could absorb the sun's energy and distribute it evenly throughout the pyramid. No one knows precisely why the Egyptians needed this technology. There's a theory the pyramids are ancient energy systems. The pharaohs applied this energy to use some unique technologies that were more advanced than all the achievements of the 21st century. And the triangular shape of the pyramids was ideal for boosting this electromagnetic energy. In theory, solar radiation, or electromagnetic forces, accumulated at the top of the pyramid, filled the inner rooms, and then went down the walls to the base. Any surface distortion could prevent the flow from spreading, so they had to create a perfectly smooth surface. That's why they installed the blocks so that nobody could squeeze a needle or razor blade between them. Many people believe in this theory because they built the pyramids from limestone. This material can hold energy inside itself. In the inner part, they created granite deposits to cause air ionization, that is, to create an electric charge. They also dug channels under the pyramid for water to transmit electricity. And at the top, they put a gold capstone, the best conductor of electricity. So this is how you get a great power generator. Different cultures used similar technologies to create electricity all over the world. But these are all theories. If it had been working, humanity would have used these technologies today. There are mentions of the metal industry, chemistry, engineering, physics, mathematics, and astronomy in some ancient records. Most scientists don't believe in all these things. We know the detailed stages of the technology's development in different cultures. In the 21st century, scientists, historians, and anthropologists can track the evolution of all modern devices. 
If people had created some technological inventions in ancient times, the history of the world would have looked different. Perhaps all the achievements of antiquity could have been wiped off the face of the earth by global cataclysms. And it can happen to us. Just imagine how people would dig up a laptop in 5,000 years. Perhaps they wouldn't understand what kind of device it is. Another Egyptian wonder surrounded by mystery is the statue of the Sphinx. The Egyptians carved it out of a single massive piece of limestone about 4.5 thousand years ago. But scientists still don't know the exact date of its construction or who built it. People painted the Sphinx in different colors, so it looked much brighter and more vivid in the distant past. It was shining just like the Great Pyramids. Anyway, time hasn't only changed its appearance, but its name too. Initially, the Egyptians called it Horemeket. The Greeks renamed it the Sphinx about a few hundred years after it had been built. The Sphinx emphasized the greatness of the rulers of Egypt. It also performed a symbolic function of a watchdog guarding the tomb of the pharaoh and the paths leading to it. This version sounds realistic, since archaeologists have discovered many secret entrances at the foot of the Sphinx. Perhaps these rooms and intricate tunnels lead to underground halls with treasures. And treasures don't always mean gold and jewelry. According to legends and theories, the Sphinx guards the Hall of Records, the storage of all humankind's knowledge. The information about the ancient mythical state of Atlantis could be there. You can find many detailed maps of the internal dungeons of the Sphinx on the internet. They show structures 12 stories deep under the statue. It looks like a small city filled with gold, scrolls of knowledge, and various ancient artifacts. But don't believe all these maps. These are just theories. Several thousand years have passed, but people have very little information about it. Archaeologists know that there are still many strange and exciting things about the Sphinx that are still undiscovered. Some locals are afraid to research because they believe they can awaken something terrible from the underground depths. Therefore, it's mostly scientists from other countries who conduct the excavations. In 1998, scientists discovered strange tunnels leading to empty rooms under the Sphinx. They realized that some people tried to get there through tunnels in the past. And maybe those people took all the treasures that were there. One of the legends says that some powerful artifact lays beneath the Sphinx. Its technology can change the whole world, but the locals are hiding it because it can damage the planet. Some believe that you can find evidence of unknown technologies painted on the granite walls in the pharaoh's tombs. But most likely, these paintings and signs tell us the myths and legends of ancient Egypt. But what if Egyptian symbols and drawings are detailed instructions for using ancient technologies? What if the locals that lived at that time thought, hmm, people in the future won't be able to get energy themselves? Let's leave some detailed instructions for them. Anyway, there are many riddles and theories. In reality, the search for answers is a dangerous undertaking, since it's not easy to get into the underground halls. Excavations can ruin the structure of the entire Sphinx. Any person inside the tunnels may get lost and never be able to find their way back. Besides, it costs a lot of money. Now what would be awesome is if people could invent some device that could scan underground areas and show their detailed models. The Great Pyramid was created as the final resting place of ancient Egyptian monarch Khufu. According to legend, French leader Napoleon entered the Great Pyramid and came back out looking shaken and super pale. He never revealed what he saw inside, but whatever it was is said to have affected him for the rest of his life. When Napoleon entered the pyramid, he would have walked through a super tight and ascending passageway. He'd then go through another passageway, known as the Great Chamber. This corridor would have been much taller than the previous one, and would have cobbles too. He then reached the King's Chamber, the centerpiece of the Great Pyramid, which was lined with huge blocks of granite but it wouldn't have looked as grand as we might imagine. 
There are no hieroglyphics decorating its walls, as Egyptians only began decorating the burial chambers of pyramids much later on. The pharaoh's tombs deep inside the pyramid would have also been filled with treasures, from chunks of gold to the world's most expensive jewelry. But this would have all been looted a long time ago. The only thing that probably would have been left in there would have been a huge sarcophagus, which would have once contained the king's mummy. He'd also have to walk past the queen's chamber. This room most likely didn't hold any queens though, as pyramids were usually only built for one person. There are mysterious tunnels leading from here. To this day, no one is really sure what they're there for. And that's not the only mysterious and creepy thing Napoleon may have encountered, as stories of pharaohs leaving ancient curses on pyramids go way back. Many pyramids had warnings written on the outside, telling of horrifying things that would happen to those who entered and disturbed the peace. We might not know what exactly Napoleon found in the Great Pyramid that scared him so much, but we know for sure what was found in Tutankhamun's tomb. Tutankhamun was an ancient Egyptian pharaoh who was only eight or nine years old when he took to the throne. He became a cultural phenomenon when his tomb was discovered almost completely intact in 1922. His pyramid sits in the Valley of Kings in Thebes, modern Luxor, which is in Egypt. Unlike the Great Pyramid, Tutankhamun's tomb was covered in beautiful wall decorations. The walls told the story of how he would travel to the afterlife through the underworld. Egyptians believed all people would have to take this journey, so they would fill their tombs with objects and paintings to help them get there. There'd also be spells painted on the walls. They believed this would help people pass over to the next realm. The journey would be pretty long, and for that reason, the ancient Egyptians would also fill the pyramids with food. Tutankhamun's pyramid was filled with eight fruit baskets. They even found something called gingerbread fruit in there. The rooms were jam-packed with furniture, statues, clothes, and staffs, amongst a whole bunch of other things. You'd likely find a lot of clothes and expensive jewelry in the pyramids as well. The ancient Egyptians wanted their ancestors to travel in style to the afterlife. They put Tutankhamun in his final resting place with over 50 pieces of clothing, all of the highest quality. There were tunics, scarves, gloves and headdresses, and a ton of jewelry. Bracelets, pennants, necklaces, rings, and scarabs for protection were all found inside. Each of them was made of gold or precious stones. There were also fans made of ostrich feathers to keep the old pharaoh cool in the hot Egyptian sun. But the temperature inside the pyramids never actually went above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The ancient Egyptians developed a super cool air conditioning system that we don't fully understand even today. Tutankhamun's pyramid also contained 130 walking sticks made from ebony, ivory, silver, and gold to help him on his journey. There were three chariots hidden away in case he got tired of all the walking. They also put 11 boat paddles inside, but there was no sign of any boat. The pyramids would be littered with the pharaoh's favorite scents and perfumes. During the excavation of Tutankhamun's pyramid, it quickly became clear that it had been robbed during ancient times. There was damage to doors and traces of oils left in empty jars. It looks like someone raided the pyramid for gold and the scents, perfumes, and oils that had been left for King Tut. There was still a bit of perfume, which was made from coconut oil and frankincense, left in one bottle. It seems like Pharaoh Tutankhamun loved board games. There was an ivory traveling set of Senet in his pyramid. Although we don't know for sure exactly how to play it, we have figured out it was sort of an ancient Egyptian version of backgammon. It looks like it was a two-player game where the goal was to knock your opponent off the board. Not really sure who Tutankhamun's mummy was supposed to play with, though. The ancient Egyptians had some rituals that may seem pretty strange to us. For example, they used to shave their eyebrows off if they ever lost a cat. So it's not too surprising they put some really weird things inside pyramids. Archaeologists discovered a collection of mummified cats and scarab beetles in pyramids that date back more than 4,000 years. They were found in the pyramids of Saqqara, which is south of Cairo. They also found a bunch of makeup kits and mirrors inside. Makeup was worn proudly by both men and women in ancient Egyptian times. Eyeliner was the most popular cosmetic. 
the Rosetta Stone was one of the best discoveries ever made in pyramids. It was found by our man Napoleon Bonaparte and his team. It's a black granite rock that dates back to 196 BCE. It's transcribed in Greek, Demotic, and Hieroglyphic. When it was translated in 1822, we got the key to understanding ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics for the very first time. The discovery of Queen Hatshepsut's mummy in 1903 changed our understanding of the Egyptians forever. After she had passed away, her successor, Satmusi III, removed most of the evidence of her reign. So we basically knew nothing about Egypt's first great female leader. She's now gone on to become one of the few and most famous female pharaohs of Egypt. Pharaoh Khufu even had a fully fledged boat in his pyramid. Archaeologists uncovered more than 1,200 pieces of a giant boat near the Great Pyramid at Giza. They reassembled the boat, and it's a whopping 144 feet long. It's most likely a solar boat, which was designed to carry the resurrected king with the deity Ra. Fun fact, the Pyramid of Giza is the last remaining of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The other six are the Hanging Gardens, the Colossus, the Temple of Artemis, the Mausoleum, the Lighthouse, and the Statue of Zeus. This pyramid was also the world's tallest man-made structure for 3,800 years, and it's the biggest pyramid in Egypt. It took a staggering 2.3 million blocks of limestone, and some weighed as much as 80 tons. It took an incredible 100,000 laborers and a whopping 23 years to build. Its original height was a mega 480 feet. In 2017, archaeologists discovered something weird about Egypt's Great Pyramid. There's a hidden void that's at least 100 feet long, and no one really knows why it's there or what's actually inside it. The weird void is the first inner structure discovered within the 4,500-year-old pyramid since the 1800s. Scientists used cosmic rays to detect the massive hole, but are still no closer today to finding out what's inside. The ancient Egyptians took a lot of care building the pyramids, and everything was strategically placed and structurally sound so it's super unlikely that this hole is due to blocks falling over time. Loads of pyramids also contain small model figurines called Ushabti. These represented attendants. They believed they would come to life to serve the pharaohs in the afterlife. But it's amazing that all this stuff actually fit inside. There isn't actually a huge amount of space inside the structures. It's mostly just rock. The year is 1923. Two teenagers sneak out of their homes in the middle of the night in Florida City. Rumor had it that an old man was building a rock castle by himself. But every time someone tried to see what the old man was doing, he would stop working. The curious teens managed to sneak into Ed's backyard and saw something they could later describe as magic. They recalled seeing rocks moving around like helium balloons. The old man was moving up to 30 tons of stone by himself to build his castle. Even if he didn't allow anyone to see him working, he would proudly talk about it around the town. But whenever people asked how he was building a stone castle all on his own, he simply answered, I cracked the secret of the pyramids. This story begins in Latvia, Edward Liedskalnin's home country. Edward was born in a small village on January 12, 1887. He was born in a family of stonemasons, which is probably where he learned ancient techniques of building. However, he grew up as a sickly boy, which meant he could never carry much weight or undergo heavy physical activity. At the age of 26, an unfortunate turn of events determined Ed's fate. The love of his life broke off their engagement and heartbroken Ed decided to move to the United States. He lived in a couple of American states before finally moving to Florida, where his life's adventure started. Ed spent years searching for the right spot of land to build his dream house. He always rejected good farmland. When people wondered why, he only smiled. Finally, when he bought land of his own, it was deemed terrible by his close friends. The soil was bedrock. He could neither plow nor farm it, but it seemed perfect for what he was seeking to build. Ed's close friends would often describe him as eccentric. When asked why he wanted to build a house, he would only say, 
It's for my sweet 16. Someday she's coming back. Then, he changed the topic of the conversation. It took Ed about 30 years to finish Coral Castle, and he did it all by himself. He would only work under the cloak of night and never, never let anyone see what he was doing. The completed Coral Castle embodies a number of unsolved mysteries. If you were to visit the site back then, you'd have to go through a nine-ton, eight-foot-tall revolving gate door that even a kid could push with just one finger. Ed was so proud of this door that he originally named the site Rock Gate Park. It was renamed Coral Castle only much later, after Ed's passing. Once inside, visitors would access the incredible wonders of Ed's constructions. Towers, mystic symbols, furniture, and swing sets, all made entirely of monolithic blocks of stone. The stones are set on top of each other, using only their weight to keep them together. And believe it or not, the entire park gathers around 1,100 tons of stone. Today, if you visit Ed's living quarters, you'll even see the simple instruments he used to construct all of this. Chisels, hammers, ropes, and pulleys. The type of work he did is difficult even with modern day equipment, let alone without it. Coral Castle's main mystery lies in how Ed managed to do it. The only photograph of Ed Liedskelnin at work shows a simple leverage structure of a chain hoist attached to a wooden tripod. The tripod was made of old telephone poles with a small wooden box on top. What was in the box is, of course, a mystery. Unfortunately, he took his secrets with him, not sharing the truth of his work with anyone else. Yet, not all is lost, as there are many theories and speculation surrounding what could have happened there. One theory says that there is a harmonic grid inside the Earth's surface, something that would create anti-gravity spots around the globe. It's believed that Coral Castle was built in such a spot. This could explain why it took Ed so long to find land that pleased him. Maybe what he was looking for was a place that allowed him to experiment with anti-gravity forces. Yet, whenever Ed talked about his work, he would say he understood the laws of weight and leverage, and, sure thing, that he had cracked the secret of the pyramid builders. And what secret is that, you might ask? According to Ed himself, it has to do with magnetism. He even published a pamphlet called Magnetic Current. There, he explains that every object has magnetic particles inside of them. A person just needs to understand where they are located inside such objects. This way, objects can be lifted and moved around without much effort, just like moving something heavy underwater. Researchers say that if we assume Ed Lietzkelnen and the pyramid builders used the same technique, then it would only have taken 4,700 workers to build the Great Pyramid of Giza, instead of the 20,000 to 100,000 that is currently estimated. But this story just keeps on getting more and more mysterious. In the late 1920s, Ed was finishing the construction of Coral Castle in Florida City. Rumors about his work had spread around town, People said Ed was hiding a stash of money somewhere in his living quarters. One night, a group of men waited until Ed was alone and broke into the castle to rob him. They couldn't find the money and, luckily, didn't harm Ed. But in the following days, he decided that it was best he moved out of that land. Of course, he took more than his toothbrush along with him. Ed decided to move the entire coral castle to another land. 10 kilometers away from where he had built the park. Legend says he hired a truck driver and asked him to swear secrecy about what Ed intended to do. He asked the driver to look away while Ed loaded the truck by himself, moving all of the rocks without any help. With the truck loaded, Ed and his castle moved to Homestead, Florida, where the park is located until this day. In 1986, a group of engineers from Florida University was called to try to fix the park's gate entrance, the nine-ton revolving door that Ed was so proud of. They arrived with plenty of modern-day equipment, including a 20-ton crane. When the engineers took the door down, they noticed 
that Ed had used a strange circular stone at the bottom of the revolving door. The engineers couldn't understand how this frisbee-sized rock could withstand nine tons of weight without breaking into pieces. They sent the rock to the geology department at the University of Florida. But the geologists simply returned the rock, saying they couldn't find a match of this rock in their databases. They couldn't determine its origin. The engineers put the nine-ton gate back into place, trying to use other techniques. At first, it didn't work without the base rock Ed had originally used. So they had to cut the gate rock to make it work as a revolving door once again, proving that modern-day technology couldn't replicate what Ed had done single-handedly. Fast forward to 2011, and another man claimed to have cracked the code of the pyramid builders and Ed Leitzkelnen himself. Wally Wallington, a retired construction worker from Lapeer County, Michigan, has managed to build using similar techniques to those used by Ed. Wallington is known for having built his personal Stonehenge in Michigan. He is said to have used simple machines such as levers and counterweights, moving around multi-thousand pound concrete blocks. Unlike Ed, Wallington has shared his techniques with the public. Multiple videos are showing the clever engineering he built from very simple materials. It sure is impressive. The man has moved his entire barn into another property just with the help of simple tools. However, there is no way to prove that these were the same techniques used to build Coral Castle. To this day, the secrets of Coral Castle haven't been unraveled. But hey, we can always keep trying to solve it. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery. So there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang, which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know, the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, 
this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made. But it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. Automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open, and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only opened the doors once a day before people entered the temple, to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky! Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. Scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around one volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls. Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. Contacts because they contact your eyes. Get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! 
Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch resistant, but still covering the entire eye. And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable, running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. We know that the ancient Egyptians were talented enough to build something as grand as the pyramids, but were they also smart enough to measure the speed of light? There's a theory circulating online that says exactly that. If you look at these two numbers, you'll see that they match completely. The first one is the speed of light in a vacuum measured in meters, and the second one is the latitude of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So was it done on purpose, or is it just a coincidence? Well, happily, we can tell you that it's actually just a coincidence, not another conspiracy thingy. The Great Pyramid is just one of the many places in the world that share the same latitude. And more importantly, even if the ancient Egyptians had somehow measured the speed of light and chosen to keep it a secret from the rest of the world, they wouldn't have used meters to put it down. Meters were only defined at the end of the 18th century. The builders of the pyramids used a different unit of measure called cubits. One cubit is equal to one and a half feet. Cubit was based on the length of the arm from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, and it became popular in the ancient world. So if they wanted to impress the rest of the world and set the pyramids at a point that matched the speed of light in cubits, they would have to build their iconic constructions somewhere in Europe. And then the Danish astronomer who first measured the speed of light in 1676 would have been really upset to know that someone had done it centuries before him. So although they were ahead of their time in many aspects, the ancient Egyptians never measured the speed of light or used longitude and latitude to map their locations. The base of the Great Pyramid of Giza might seem like a perfect square, but it's actually an eight-sided structure, not four-sided. Each of its four sides has a subtle concave indentation that splits it evenly from base to tip. The official version is that a British pilot was the first to notice it in 1940 while flying over the pyramid. He took a photograph that showed shadows highlighting these indentations. Some people think these lines are only visible from above and can best be seen at dawn and dusk during the spring and autumn equinoxes. This has led to a freaky theory that the ancient Egyptians might have designed the pyramids to communicate with something looking at them from above. Uh huh. Now, the Great Pyramid is one of only three pyramids that used to have a swivel door. It weighed around 20 tons, but they could still easily open it from the inside. Its precise fit made it nearly invisible from the outside, with no visible latch or handle. There were only slight variations in the exterior stone that gave out an opening. The other two pyramids with similar doors belong to Khufu's father and grandfather. The Great Pyramid also has a hidden void at least 100 feet long that was only found in 2017. We still don't know what lies within the space, what purpose it served, or if it is the only space of its kind. Researchers use the same tech to see through cathedral walls, Mayan pyramids, and even volcanoes. It depends on a natural shower of subatomic particles called muons. They pass more easily through empty space than through solid materials. So if they arrange multiple muon detectors around a structure, scientists can map out its solid and empty areas. A team of scientists placed muon detectors inside the Great Pyramid and allowed them to gather data for months. Scientists have analyzed samples of the mortar used to build the pyramids many times. Although we know its composition, modern technology still can't replicate it. The mortar is mostly made from processed gypsum, but it wasn't used like the cement we use for bricks today. Instead, they used it to support the joints between the massive stones as they were set in place. The estimated amount they needed to construct the Great Pyramid was around half a million tons of mortar. The gypsum mortar is stronger than the stones themselves, 
and has held up for thousands of years. Now, all four sides of the Great Pyramid are aligned with the cardinal points – north, south, east, and west. According to geologist and engineer Glenn Dash, the alignment is accurate to within four minutes of arc, or one-fifteenth of a degree. The architects managed to achieve this without modern tools like drones, blueprints, or computers. Many researchers tried to explain this construction miracle. Maybe they used the pole star or the sun's shadow. Dash recently proposed a new simpler idea. The Egyptians might have used the autumnal equinox to align the pyramids. It happens twice a year when the Earth's equator passes through the center of the sun's disk, making day and night nearly equal in length. To test his theory, Dash conducted an experiment on the 22nd of September 2016, the first day of the fall equinox. He used a special rod the Egyptians had to cast a shadow and track its tip at regular intervals, forming a smooth curve. By connecting two points of the curve with a taut string, he created an almost perfect east-west line. Dash noted that on the equinox, the shadow's tip runs in a straight line, nearly perfectly east-west, and with a slight counterclockwise error. There's a similar error in the pyramids. Although his experiment was conducted in Connecticut, Dash believes that the same method would work in Egypt. All the ancient Egyptians needed was a clear, sunny day. They could determine the fall equinox by counting 91 days from the summer solstice. But they left us few clues, and no engineering documents or architectural plans have been found that explain their methods. So they might have mapped shadows, but it's not definite. Now, scientists have long wondered how heavy stone blocks were carried to the pyramid sites, and they might finally have an answer. A research team from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, has discovered that 31 pyramids are likely to have been built along a long-lost ancient branch of the River Nile. It's now hidden under desert and farmland. For many years, archaeologists have thought that ancient Egyptians must have used a nearby waterway to transport materials, equipment, people, and whatever else they needed to build the pyramids on the river. But up until now, they weren't certain of the location, shape, size, or proximity of this waterway to the site of the pyramids. The group of researchers used radar satellite imagery, historical maps, geophysical surveys, and sediment coring to map the river branch. They believe it was buried by a major drought and sandstorms thousands of years ago. The team managed to go below the sand surface and get images of some hidden features thanks to radar technology. They found hidden rivers and ancient structures running at the foothills of where most of the ancient Egyptian pyramids lie. The discovery of this extinct river branch helps explain the high pyramid density between Giza and Lish, in what is now an inhospitable area of the Sahara Desert. Now, Egypt isn't the only country with the most pyramids in the world. The champion's title here goes to its southern neighbor, Sudan. It has between 200 and 255 pyramids, compared to Egypt's measly 138. They were built by members of the Kingdom of Kush, an ancient civilization that ruled the lands along the Nile River many years ago. They started erecting pyramids around 500 years after the Egyptians had stopped doing it. Their pyramids are much smaller than the Egyptian ones, but were built for the same purposes. Archaeologists are still working to find out how the pyramids in the Sudan were built, how long it took to complete them, and what happened to their society. Most people know that pyramids were built as grand tombs for the pharaohs, designed to ensure they had a smooth journey to the afterlife. The Great Pyramid of Giza, for instance, was constructed for the pharaoh Khufu. But what most people don't know is that this whole pyramid building trend started right here with the Step Pyramid of Djoser, about 4,700 years ago. This massive structure was built for Pharaoh Djoser, a ruler from Egypt's third dynasty. It rises seven layers high above the ground and stands about 200 feet tall. We think of it today as a phenomenal architectural project. But for ancient Egyptians, the Step Pyramid of Djoser turned out to be more like a massive experiment, a trial run, if you will to perfect their building skills before they moved on to even more ambitious pyramids. Reaching new heights is super exciting, but the real mystery is what is going on below the ground. In this pyramid's underground labyrinth, there is a network of tunnels stretching about 3.5 miles long. 
And some researchers believe these tunnels might have been part of a sophisticated water system that could completely change what we think about pyramid construction. Let's talk about this massive complex located in Saqqara. Surrounding the pyramid, there's what's known as a dry moat, a continuous trench that is up to 164 feet wide and almost 2 miles long. It forms a sort of rectangular shape around the pyramid. This trench has an average depth of about 65 feet. Now, if you were to add up all the earth and rock they dug out to create this moat, it would be about 10 times the volume of the step pyramid itself. For the longest time, people just assumed this trench was nothing more than a huge quarry, a place where they dug up stone and clay to build the step pyramid. Makes sense, right? Hmm. But when you take a closer look, it doesn't add up. The trench is too narrow and deep to be practical for mining, and its layout doesn't match anything we know about ancient Egyptian quarrying methods. Plus, some sections of the trench are actually covered with a rocky ceiling, which would have made it nearly impossible to use as a quarry. Another theory suggests that the dry moat had some kind of spiritual significance. Maybe it was a sacred place, where souls of nobles gathered to serve the late king in the afterlife. There are even niches in the walls that work as a hint at this spiritual function. But most researchers believe that this purpose likely developed much later, long after the complex was built for Djoser. So what was the moat really designed for? In 2020, a researcher came up with a pretty intriguing idea. It is possible that this trench was actually designed to collect and manage water, especially after heavy rainfalls. Now, that makes sense when you consider the location. The moat sits in an area that could easily have been flooded by runoff water from nearby plains. This could also explain why the trench wasn't used for new graves until much later when the climate became drier and less prone to flooding. The story becomes even more intriguing, as this trench appears to be part of a larger, more complex hydraulic system within the Djoser complex. It is like the trench has several compartments, carefully carved out of the rock and connected by tunnels. These compartments likely served as a part of a water treatment system, where water would flow from one compartment to the next, getting cleaner as it moved along. Now, here is where things start to tie into the pyramid itself. The Djoser complex has a series of underground shafts, and some researchers think that water from the moat's deep trench might have been used to power a hydraulic lift system. And this giant water-powered elevator could have been used to raise the heavy stones needed to build the pyramid. It worked like a volcano, but instead of lava, water did the heavy lifting. Imagine a big deep hole in the ground at the center of the pyramid site. Inside this hole, there was a huge wooden platform, kind of like a giant raft that could move up and down. When the workers wanted to lift a heavy stone, they would fill the hole with water. As the water rose, the wooden platform started to float up, carrying the stone with it, almost like a giant water-powered elevator. When the stone reached the right height, the workers slid it off the platform and onto the pyramid. The idea is that water from the deep trench after being clean and filtered, would flow into these shafts. A massive float, possibly made of wood, would then rise as the water filled the shaft, lifting the stones up to where they were needed for construction. Once the stone was in place, they'd let the water out, lowering the platform back down to the bottom, ready to lift the next stone. This fancy hydraulic lift system could have been a game-changer, making the whole building process a lot faster and more efficient without using a lot of workforce. It is like the ancient Egyptians were already embracing the whole idea of work smarter, not harder. But of course, not everyone is on board with this theory. Some experts argue that the area where the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser was built couldn't have held enough water from occasional rains to maintain such a fancy hydraulic system. The main theory suggests that, in the past, there might have been some kind of lake nearby that would have filled up after a period of rain, and this lake could have supplied water to the complex's hydraulic system. But there is no mention of such a lake in any ancient Egyptian writings, so it might be more of a what-if situation than a reality. 
And then there's the issue of the hard work itself. Remember when I said this method could have allowed the ancient builders to raise stones with far less effort? Well, that might not be entirely true. According to some experts, just building this hydraulic device would have required a lot more heavy work than simply moving the stone blocks using good old-fashioned manpower. And let's not forget, the step pyramid of Djoser is like a baby pyramid compared to those that came later. The stones used for Djoser's pyramid weighed, on average, about 660 pounds each, which is nothing compared to the more than 2.5 ton blocks used later for the pyramid of Chephren. If this cool water lift theory gets completely ruled out, we still need to explain how this pyramid was built in the first place. To answer that, we need to rewind a bit and talk about the original plans. See, before Djoser's tomb became a pyramid, the idea was to construct a simple mastaba. This type of tomb was pretty common in earlier periods – a flat-roofed, rectangular structure with sloping sides. But after the original mastaba was finished, they decided to expand it a bit by adding more layers on top. And then they added even more layers, until the construction reached six distinctive steps, each one smaller than the previous. And they probably did all this by raising those heavy stones using ramps, not a water-powered elevator. There is still so much we don't know about the Step Pyramid of Djoser. More research is definitely needed to fully understand how this system worked, or if it even existed at all. But the idea of using water to help build the pyramid adds a whole new layer to our understanding of ancient Egyptian engineering. It's a powerful reminder of just how clever and resourceful those builders were, using the natural landscape and the power of water to create one of the most iconic monuments in history. Leave it to people wandering on Google Earth to stumble upon the world's newest and weirdest places ever. Like this mysterious pyramid discovered in Antarctica. Soon enough, the internet blew up with all sorts of theories regarding this unusual shape. Could it be a sign from a different life form? Is this pyramid indeed natural, or is it man-made? For starters, it's not the first time we've discovered a pyramid in the Antarctic. The first one was observed by the British Antarctic Expedition in the 1910s and kept secret for a long time. Its discovery being kept hidden only added to the mystery. A second such structure was discovered in 2016, which further increased the interest in the matter. The mystery was soon enough deciphered by scientists. These formations are just mountains. They're located near the Ellsworth Mountains, a range over 250 miles long so they're just mountain peaks that have broken through the ice sheet. As for their particular shape, it's just a coincidence. Pyramids are found throughout nature. The Matterhorn in the Alps and Mount Ballenstinder in Iceland, for example, are quite similar in terms of shape. As for the official name of these peaks, they're called nunataks, or peaks of rock peeking through a glacier or an ice sheet. Antarctica has way more incredible features like the fact that it's home of 60 to 90 percent of the world's fresh water. That's because its ice sheet is the biggest on our planet, stretching across 5.4 million square miles. I'll spare you the calculations, but that leaves only 1 percent of the continent ice-free. Antarctica's ice reaches 2.7 miles thick at its deepest point, meaning half the height of Mount Everest. Should it ever melt completely, our sea levels would rise to roughly 200 feet. It wasn't always this cold, though. At some point in our planet's history, Antarctica had some average temperatures as the city of Melbourne has today. It took a lot of research, but scientists figured out that Antarctica's temperatures could have reached up to 62.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Sure, that was 40 to 50 million years ago, but if you think about it, it was at the same time when dinosaurs roamed our Earth. Time is also different on this icy continent. All the lines of longitude that help us calculate different time zones merge into a single point at the South Pole. Here, there are six months of daylight in the summer, followed by six months of complete darkness during the colder season. So, scientists working here stay, on average, in the same time zone they've come from. Ah! 
The Blood Falls aren't a chapter of a thriller movie. They are merely a series of waterfalls located in one of the driest regions of Antarctica. They emerge from an underground lake filled with a special type of bacteria. These little organisms use sulfates as fuel instead of sugars, which makes them very intriguing for scientists. The water contained in this lake is so full of iron that it basically just rusts when it meets air. So, the reddish color of the waterfall also gives it its trademark name. The Megalodon was the largest predator ever known in our planet's history. In terms of its location, the Megalodon lived practically in all waters on our globe, except near the poles. The reason why there are no Megalodon teeth found in Antarctica is probably because the gigantic creature was adapted to only warm tropical and subtropical waters. If you plan to visit Antarctica by boat someday, just know you might not get there on a non-metallic boat. The hull of your transportation device must be made of either steel or aluminum to withstand the harsh weather conditions here. Antarctica isn't home to a lot of bugs. In fact, there is only one true species of insect that calls this place home. It's a wingless midge called Belgica antarctica. This fly is so tiny that it only reaches 0.08 to 0.23 inches long, but it's still the Antarctic's largest terrestrial animal. A lot of Antarctic fish also come with an antifreeze substance in their blood. They don't necessarily need it for protection against the cold temperature, but mostly against touching ice. These antifreezes are made up of large glycoprotein molecules. They surround any small ice crystals that may form, making sure they don't spread through the animal's tissues, which could cause a lot of damage. They also create a sort of small pillow blocking the sharp ice crystals, so they're less likely to cause any pain. It also doesn't rain a lot here on this icy continent, but one amazing meteorological quirk of Antarctica is that it's full of diamond dust. This dust is basically small ice crystals that pop out of humid air close to the Earth's surface. Think of it like an icy fog. As they flow through the air and get touched by sunlight, they begin to sparkle, making visitors here feel like they're surrounded by diamonds. It's probably the last place you'd want to go into labor, but in 1978, the first person was born here ever. Emil Marco Palma was its name, and ever since, 10 other people have been born here in Antarctica. There's a lake on this icy continent that is so full of salt, it makes it impossible for it to freeze over, even if temperatures can go as low as 5 degrees Fahrenheit. That's because pure water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Water that has salt in it, or any other substance for that matter, will freeze, but at a way lower temperature. That lower temperature is adjustable, depending on the substance itself and the amount that has been placed into the water. Antarctica was the last official continent to be discovered. It remained completely unseen until the 1820s. But it took another 20 years to confirm it was actually a continent and not just a group of icy islands. Just because it's really cold here doesn't mean you can't go on a date here. One December night, an American scientist that was posted in Antarctica logged into a dating app simply out of curiosity. He was certain no other profiles would show up, but to his surprise, he found someone soon enough. Another researcher who was stationed just 45 minutes away, by helicopter of course. They eventually got together and went on the first date in Antarctica ever recorded. Apart from ice, this continent has something else way more abundantly than any other piece of land on Earth. Meteorites. If we look at the research done by scientists, Meteorites have equal chances of reaching any place on our planet. However, once they go through our atmosphere, the situation is a bit more complex. That's because different climates on our planet, like the humid ones found near the jungle, have a lot of moisture and oxygen, which will corrode most meteorites. The climate in Antarctica is really dry, so the possibility of meteorites corroding is little to none. More so, it's way easier to spot these rocks on the icy, white surface of this area than in any other place on Earth. If you're not scared of the cold, you'll surely freak out when you hear about the winds here. That's because Antarctica is, for the most part, the windiest place on Earth. Wind speeds have been reported here to reach even 200 miles per hour.
You have heard about Nikola Tesla? You have definitely heard about the Great Pyramids in Egypt. But what if I told you that Tesla may have probably uncovered the ancient mystery surrounding the pyramids? Wait, what? Is this a crossover episode? Nope. It's highly probable that the secrets of the pyramids are hidden in plain sight. But first, let's recap what we know about the pyramids. What's so mysterious about them? I mean, they are just old quirky buildings, aren't they? One of the biggest questions is how they were built. Some people think that the pyramids were created by people using only their hands and muscles. But others think that there might have been some kind of crazy energy source that we don't know about yet. Like what if aliens helped out or something? Just kidding. But this idea of some unknown energy source being used to build the pyramids has been around for ages. Even in old texts, like the pyramid texts, it talks about how the gods gave us something to build a great power. So maybe there was something really powerful and mysterious going on back then? Who knows? Back in the early 1900s, he got obsessed with the great pyramids of Egypt. He read numerous books about these ancient structures and was blown away by how much energy they seemed to have. At that time, not many people knew much about electricity, and Tesla started to wonder if there was some kind of advanced tech hidden in the pyramids. He had an idea that the power of the pyramids had to do with electromagnetism, and he put a lot of time and effort into trying to figure out the mystery. Tesla had some pretty unusual theories about the Great Pyramids. He thought that they could actually store and move electricity, which could then be used to power up the areas around them. He also had this theory that the pyramids were built using some kind of crystal energy. He believed that the chambers inside the pyramids could have these super powerful crystals that could control the electromagnetic fields. But that's not all. Tesla also had this idea that the materials used to make the pyramids had properties that allowed them to trap energy from the sun and the moon. And not just a little bit of energy. He thought that the pyramid could actually create this massive energy field that could light up whole cities or even brighten up dark places. He thought that the pyramids could be used as giant power plants to generate electricity and run machines. Tesla even believed that the pyramids were somehow linked to cosmic energy, which could be used for spiritual enlightenment and healing. How very new age of him. Anyway, Tesla wasn't just pulling these ideas out of thin air. He was seriously into studying everything he could about the pyramids, from ancient artifacts and texts to hieroglyphs and drawings. And he came up with this idea that the pyramids were designed to be energy amplifiers, and some kind of unknown energy source was used during their construction. Some people thought Tesla was eccentric for coming up with these theories, but his ideas have actually had a huge impact on the way we think about the pyramids today. Researchers and scholars have been digging into his theories for years and using them to uncover some of the biggest mysteries surrounding these ancient structures. For example, recently scientists have used theoretical physics to investigate how the Great Pyramid of Egypt would react to certain radio waves. They found out that if the radio waves were a certain length, the pyramid could concentrate the energy inside its rooms and focus it under its base. The scientists did lots of calculations to figure this out. They first thought about what radio wavelengths would work best. Then they made a model of how the pyramid would react to the waves. They figured out how much of the energy from the waves would get absorbed or spread out. Lastly, they checked how the energy would move around inside the pyramid when the waves hit it. To help explain all of this, the scientists used something called multipole analysis. This is when you take a complicated object and break it down into simpler parts. Then you can see how each part interacts with the energy that's coming in. It's like taking apart a puzzle to see how each piece fits together. The researchers are interested in how all of this can be used in the future. They want to make really tiny particles that can do the same thing as the pyramid, but with light. By changing the size, shape, and the material of these particles, they can control how the light moves around them. This can be really useful for things like making tiny sensors or super efficient solar cells. The scientists had to make some guesses when they were doing their research. They assumed that there weren't any hidden spaces inside the pyramid, 
and that the material used to build it was all the same. But even with these guesses, they still made some pretty impressive discoveries. But the pyramid study is not the only proof that Tesla was ahead of his time. There are more Tesla's projects that seemed unrealistic at the time, but that scientists and enthusiasts reevaluate and try to implement today. Let's talk about Tesla's most ambitious project, the Wardenclyffe Transmission Tower. Back in 1900, Tesla was already a big shot when it came to electrical engineering in America. People were blown away by his amazing inventions and the fact that he managed to outdo Thomas Edison in the battle of currents. However, Tesla wasn't content to rest on his laurels. He decided to embark on his most ambitious project yet, the transmission tower at Wardenclyffe. It was built between 1901 and 1905, and it was based on one of Tesla's breakthrough ideas. He had a vision to make the impossible possible by creating a global wireless communication system. It would use Earth itself as a conductor, transmitting music, news, stock market reports, secured military communications, and even facsimile images. Does it sound familiar? Right, it sounds just like the internet that we use today, only without the use of any wires. But Tesla had a much bigger dream in mind, to transmit power wirelessly. He already proved that high-frequency signals could be sent without any wires using his Tesla coil transformers, and this sparked his obsession with wireless energy transmission. His vision was to not only transform the way we communicate, but also to find a way to transfer power currents globally by tapping into the Earth's natural energy. Tesla believed that there was an abundance of free energy all around us that could be used for humanity's benefit. In 1899, he conducted some top-secret experiments and got convinced that it was possible to transmit electrical power through the Earth's upper atmosphere. This is actually how the Wardenclyffe Tower was created. It was supposed to be the prototype station for a network of towers all over the globe that would provide the whole world with wireless energy. Unfortunately, Tesla didn't have the resources or the patience of his investors to bring this project to fruition. It ran into all sorts of financial problems and roadblocks, and in 1917, the unfinished tower was finally torn down for scrap metal to pay off Tesla's mounting debts. Now it remains a sad reminder that even the greatest minds can sometimes fall short of their dreams. The original red brick laboratory, however, is still there, and it is the only Tesla lab that has survived. Fun fact, in 2017, a film crew made a crazy discovery. They used ground-penetrating radar to explore the area around Wardenclyffe, and they found a whole series of tunnels stretching for hundreds of feet underneath the site. Nobody knows exactly what these tunnels were used for, but people have been speculating for years that they were part of Tesla's grand plan. Wardenclyffe, of course, is a major landmark for Tesla enthusiasts from all over the world. Who knows, maybe someone will finally crack the mystery of the tunnels one day. But even if they don't, the legacy of Tesla and his amazing ideas lives on. It's nighttime, and you're about to walk inside Pharaoh Tutankhamun's final resting place. You know, King Tut. You don't have a torch, but at least you came with a flashlight. You walk down several flights of stairs and observe how the walls are carved in hieroglyphics and what looks like a spell. Those who take anything from this place will be doomed for life, the spell says. Even if you don't really believe it, this scares you a little bit. You find a huge stone door. Is it a trap? You manage to open it, but oh no, it's only an empty chamber. You check your map. It seems like you're heading in the right direction. After what feels like hours, you realize you must be trapped inside a labyrinth. You try to retrace your steps, but you can't find the door where you came in from anymore. That's it, you think to yourself. You've fallen for the pharaoh's trap. What's worse, you didn't bring a lunch. Okay, so we've all seen Hollywood movies where the main character is exploring ancient ruins and faces some seriously dangerous traps, right? We've been told Egyptian royalty protected their final resting places with venomous scorpions and snakes, sliding doors that will trap you for life, and giant rolling boulders that will crush anyone on their paths. The thing is, were these traps truly real? Well, I regret to be the one to break it to you, but this is all fiction. These elaborate traps were too technologically advanced for ancient civilizations to pull off. That is not to say, however, that there weren't any traps at all. Ancient civilizations, like the Egyptians and the Mayans, 
are known for their practice of building entire monuments dedicated to the ones who had passed away. These structures would often reflect the position of person occupied in society. So, for the really important people, the VIPs of their times, massive monuments were built to host their bodies long after they were gone. Some of these civilizations believed that a person's life would continue on the other side of the veil. For that reason, a person would be buried together with the belongings of their current life. If they had a lot of money and power and stuff, that meant their resting places would be filled with riches and gold. Now imagine if you lived in ancient Egypt, and you knew exactly where all the pharaoh's tombs were located, and had heard rumors of the amount of wealth kept in these places. Maybe you would be tempted to go check it out, right? We're talking about large rooms filled from floor to ceiling with golden artifacts, jewels, and even money. I mean, it does sound tempting. And since there weren't any security guards protecting the entrance of these places, Egyptians needed to get creative as to how they would protect these riches. These old civilizations found some traps to be useful. A recurring one was building empty rooms inside the monument to confuse a burglar. Now, let's take a look at Amenhotep III's final resting place as an example. It was built in the city of Luxor, in a spot also known as the Western Valley of the Kings. Two French engineers originally discovered the monument between 1905 and 1914 CE. The structure is huge and has more than 10 chambers, connected by long corridors and steep stairways. The king's chamber is the most hidden one, and for an outsider to try and find it, they will probably enter a lot of empty rooms beforehand. Other pharaohs tried to protect their riches by commissioning monuments with false doors concealing pits that were up to 20 feet deep. This way, an unwarned and unwanted visitor would be surprised by the deep hole on their way to the king's resting chamber. Alongside false doors, pharaohs made sure to build labyrinth-style corridors and false walls. This way, robbers could take hours or days before they found the king's real chamber. As to pits with poisonous snakes on them, if there were any reptiles inside these monuments, they probably got inside on their own and would most likely not stay there for long. There is no way snakes would survive years and years without food inside these pits. So yes, another Hollywood-induced belief right there. If these traps seem boring to you, archaeologists did find an interesting deterrent in the final resting place of the Red Queen of Polanque in Mexico. Polanque was one of the most powerful Mayan cities in pre-Columbian Mexico. And the Red Queen was believed to be the grandmother of the last Mayan king, undoubtedly a person of immense importance to the empire. In her honor, a huge monument was built to keep her body after her passing. The discovery of the tomb itself was already thrilling. Archaeologists found an ancient monument when digging at the site back in 1994. The first thing they found was a room with a hidden door. Once they opened the door, they discovered a long corridor. Finally, at the end of this corridor was the Queen's Chamber. The team of archaeologists was beyond excited to unearth this chamber with the mummy of the Queen herself still inside it. They found her to be accompanied by her pearls, jade shells, and expensive rocks. But as the team explored the remains, they saw something rather strange. The room was filled with a red-colored powder. Researchers knew that the color red was important to the Mayan people, and that much of their clothing and buildings were decorated with this color. But they didn't understand why the queen was buried with this unknown red substance. After they took a sample back with them for further analysis, they discovered that the red powder was cinnabar, a very dangerous mineral. This powder, when inhaled, can cause, shall we say, severe health damage to a person. The team concluded that this could only be a trap for anyone trying to steal her riches. Okay, so dangerous powders might have worked as the most intense traps we've seen until now. But perhaps the cheapest way to keep out unwanted visitors was to advertise spells written out all over the monument. We'd probably laugh at these today, but back in the day, they were more or less effective. Spells usually said that the person who took anything from that place 
would meet a tragic fate. Some spells said that robbers would lose their houses in big fires or terrible floods. Other spells said burglars would have incurable and undiagnosed health issues, but they weren't really enough to stop people from taking any gold. There are some stories surrounding how these spells might have been real. One of them is from the famous British Egyptologist Howard Carter, the one responsible for unearthing Pharaoh Tutankhamun's resting place in the 1920s. After months of unsuccessful digging, Carter discovered the tomb's existence by chance. He found the entrance to a stairway right beneath the soil where he had been searching all those months. With the help of a team, he cleared the piles of sand blocking the stairs and discovered a doorway. The door had several royal symbols carved into it, and Carter knew this could only mean a very important person had been buried there. And he was right. With a chisel, he made a hole in the top left-hand corner of the doorway and lit his vision with the help of a candle. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. The reflection of several golden and jeweled items crowding the chamber before him. Lost for 3,000 years, Carter had just discovered the final resting place of King Tut. But the story didn't finish here. This discovery was accompanied by a series of unfortunate events that led people to believe it had something to do with the pharaoh's spell. Carter himself mysteriously passed away just a few years later. And some of his assistants lost their houses in floods, just like one of the spells threatened. Some say it's just coincidental, as there's no real proof of these things being connected. Well, what do you think? Was this an effective trap after all? Can you tell me what date it is today? Piece of cake. You just look at your smartphone and voila, you immediately know the day, month, and year. But was it always this easy to tell the date? Did the ancient people even have the concept of a year that lasts 365 days? Yes and no. Mayan calendars had cycles. That's close to what we call a year. But the Mayan cycle was much longer. 819 days. And this is where the mystery begins. 819 days compared to what? When does this calendar begin and when does it end? Scientists were asking themselves this question for decades. They discovered and deciphered the Mayan calendar during the 1940s. Recently, two American scientists, John Linden and Victoria Bricker, came forward with a solution. So, what did they do differently from their predecessors? The duo deciphered the code by broadening their thinking. They expanded the calendar from 819 days to full 45 years. That's 20 times longer than the original cycle. And a pattern started to emerge. This was a major breakthrough because the Maya told time in a complicated way. You can forget about the easy-to-read Arabic numerals we have today. These ancient people used glyphs. These are tiny images that represent characters. Something like the icons on your desktop or universal symbols. When you see a little dot with three curved lines above it, you know there is a Wi-Fi network available. The Mayan calendar used glyphs that represented animals or natural phenomena. For example, there were symbols for a jaguar and an eagle. Each glyph marked one day. Each cycle is repeated four times, 8 and 19 x 4. Let's call these four cycles blocks. The Mayas colored each block differently. Scientists thought these colors corresponded to the four cardinal directions. Red was east, white, north. West was black and finally, yellow marked south. But then the 1980s came. Yeah, this was a weird decade. The calculations were all wrong. Researchers determined that the colors were associated with the position of the sun in the sky. It turned out that the color yellow represented the highest point of the sun, which is called a zenith. White was the lowest point, called the nadir. It seems that the calendar showed just how good the ancient Mayas were at astronomy. This is most evident at Chichen Itza. This principal Mayan city is located on the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. There stands an impressive step pyramid. It is dedicated to the feathered serpent deity, and its alignment is perfect. Something marvelous happens here twice a year, during the equinoxes, March and September. These are the times when the sun shines directly over the equator. On these two dates, the day and night last the same. At the site of the pyramid, sunlight first illuminates the sculpture of the serpent head at the base of the structure. Then it makes its way up the 91 steps. This creates the illusion that a snake is slithering down the pyramid. Even today, people gather to witness the sight. 
and it must have been more impressive when the Mayas completed the structure 1050-1300 CE. Do you know what a synodic period is? Neither do I. But Mayan astronomers did. A synodic period is the time that passes before a stellar body does a full lap. For example, this is the period between two full moons. When you look from Earth, this period lasts roughly 30 days. And the Mayas were looking at the skies non-stop. They carefully noted the synodic periods of all planets. From Venus to Saturn, these ancient astronomers kept records of nearly all celestial bodies. But what does this have to do with their calendar? The American researchers' calculations revealed the link. Let's take the planet closest to the Sun as an example, Mercury. Its synodic period is 117 days. Multiply that by 7 and you get which number? Exactly 8 to 19, 117 x7 equals sign 819. Coincidence? Definitely not. Because synodic periods of other planets also neatly match the magical figure, 819. But this is not visible from a single Mayan cycle. Scientists had to expand it several times to discover the pattern. There is a reason why no one could decipher the code for so long. They were focused on a single planet. The trick was to add the Mayan calculation for all the planets. Researchers just needed to see the bigger picture. This brings us to the year 2012. Can you remember that some people thought that the world would end on December 21st? That turned out to be a bust. We are alive and well now. But what started this false rumor? The Mayan calendar, of course. You see, these ancient people based their calendar on long periods of all the planets. That included a lot of complicated math and a lot of multiplying. This 2012 was simply the time when their cycle ended. It is known as the long count. This period is the same as our year. For the Mayas, 2012 was something like the 31st of December for us. Just an end of a cycle in which they measured time, so there was no need to panic. Those New Year's Eve parties might be a bit wild, but the world doesn't end on January 1st. The Mayas stretched more than their calendar. Rubber was the name of the game. Yes, you've heard it correctly. These ancient people were making different grades of rubber 3,000 years before one famous American did, Charles Goodyear. They would extract natural latex from the rubber tree. This is a milky substance that can be turned into rubber. And they weren't the only ones. Scientists found evidence that their neighbors, the Aztecs and the Olmecs, did the same. But what did they do with rubber? They didn't need car tires, definitely. But it's cool to have a nice pair of sandals for the beach. The Spanish wrote about rubber sole footwear that natives wore. Sadly, scientists still haven't found them. That would be a big step for archaeology. So the Maya were playful with rubber, literally. Researchers guessed that they produced balls from latex. These were bouncy and ranged in size from a softball to a soccer ball. A typical Mayan ball game, pits, involved two hoops. You must be thinking basketball, but not quite. The hoops were set on walls, 23 feet high. Compare that to the NBA standard of 10 feet. And the hoop was the other way around. There is also a sweet side to the story of the Mayas. These ancient people enjoyed chocolate. In fact, the modern word chocolate probably comes from their language, socolatl. This meant bitter water. Okay, you get the bitter part, but why water? The Mayas didn't produce chocolate in the form we know it today. They didn't make bars of chocolate. They drank it. Smashed cocoa beans made for excellent drinks. The Mayas perfected the mixture over time and even added spices. Anyone up for a fiery chocolate drink with stew peppers and cornmeal? Who knows, maybe this beverage actually tasted well. Cocoa beans were sacred and used as a currency. Researchers believe all social classes got to enjoy it. Free chocolate for all sounds nice even today. But where did the Mayas get clean water for their cocoa drinks? From the oldest known filtration system in the Western Hemisphere. It was based on zeolite. These are minerals that contain aluminum and silicone compounds. And guess what? Modern air and water purifiers still use this material. Mayan tech wins yet again. Back in Europe, Roger Bacon developed a sand filtration system in 1627, some 1,800 years after the Mayas. But what about regions without rivers, lakes, or springs? Mayan engineers had it all figured out. Rainwater. They would carve out large reservoirs in the limestone bedrock. Then, they would coat these underground caves with a layer of a watertight material. The final step was to make small channels that collected water from the hills above. 
Scientists estimated that just one of these reservoirs could hold on average 10,000 gallons of rainwater, enough to fill 55 modern hot tubs. If there's a question that still baffles archaeologists to this day, it's this one. How did the ancient Egyptians build those magnificent pyramids? As far as we know today, their resources were quite limited, especially in terms of tools and building materials. We still don't have a fully satisfying answer. But hey, we've got some pretty amazing theories worth considering. The leading contender among these theories involves the clever Egyptians employing a sneaky strategy. Now picture this. They constructed a slanted and curving mound made of bricks, earth, and sand encircling the pyramid to be. As the pyramid grew taller and taller, they simply increased the height and length of this wacky structure. It's like they were playing an ancient game of Jenga. Now, how did they get those massive stone blocks up there? Well, according to the legendary ancient Greek historian Herodotus, they used sleds, rollers, and levers. It sounds like they turned construction into a supersized game of tug of war. And guess what? Herodotus also claimed that the Great Pyramid, hmm. you know, the one from Giza, the granddaddy of them all, took a whopping 20 years to build. There's more. Herodotus also dropped a mind-boggling number on us. 100,000 men were supposedly involved in this pyramid extravaganza. Did they hire the entire Egyptian population? Well, it might not be as far-fetched as it sounds. These men were probably mostly farmers, so they probably focused on the pyramids when there wasn't much work to be done in the fields. You know, like during the flood season of the Nile River. Obviously, specialists in the archaeological community had something to add to this theory. By the late 20th century, they discovered some evidence that suggests the workforce might have been smaller and more permanent than previously thought. Instead of a massive army of 100,000 pyramid builders, they proposed that a modest crew of around 20,000 workers, accompanied by support personnel like bakers, physicians, and even spiritual leaders, could have gotten the job done. There was also this theory that claimed that the pyramids were actually built from the top downward. It suggested that these colossal structures were nothing more than isolated hills used as quarries. The stones were supposedly drawn from these hills, and over time, competing engineers took charge and transformed them into the iconic pyramids we know today. Now, before you dismiss this theory as a wild fantasy, some folks thought it wasn't completely crazy. After all, there are instances where isolated hills exist, so maybe this theory had a tiny glimmer of truth. Whether it involved ramp building or ingenious work schedules, one thing is clear. Those pyramids have definitely left their mark on history and on our imaginations. Now, Speaking of ancient Egyptian mysteries, there's this gigantic unfinished obelisk sitting in ancient Egypt, and scientists are trying to figure out how it was shaped. Now, Some people suggest that our industrious ancestors use handheld pounders to get the job done. One expert has a different take on the matter, though. He argues that if we take a closer look at the pattern left behind by the shaping tool, we'll notice something peculiar. The walls of the trenches surrounding the obelisk display a neat and even pattern, which is pretty unlikely if they were pounded away by mere mortal hands. According to this expert, those horizontal striations are usually the result of a tool that takes breaks while removing material leaving its mark on the surface. But wait, there's more! Imagine the tool being rocked back and forth against the trench walls, clearing away the waste to keep the trench from narrowing. Well, in that case, the tool might have left some funky horizontal striations where it was pressed against the sidewall. This sounds like some fancy technology at play, don't you think? And guess what? The dynastic Egyptians probably didn't have access to that kind of know-how. Another famous Egyptologist from way back also uncovered a bunch of core drills during his adventures. Although the actual drill bits are missing, his collection houses these particular core remnants made of limestone, alabaster, and even granite. These constructions aren't the only amazing thing the ancient Egyptians left behind, though. As it turns out, the Egyptians were the genius minds behind the creation of the handheld mirror. Yeah, that little mirror you use every day to check yourself out. But here's the twist. These mirrors are like pieces of art. They were decorated with inscriptions and figures. But that's not all. The Egyptians had a serious concern with their appearance. 
they knew the importance of personal hygiene and looking fabulous. So, in their quest for pearly whites, they invented toothbrushes and toothpaste. Dental problems were pretty common back then, and their smiles weren't exactly all white. Dentistry wasn't their strongest suit, you see. Maybe their minds were distracted by all that pyramid building. So, that doesn't mean those ancient toothpaste recipes weren't amazing. One delightful concoction included rock salt, mint, dried iris petals, and pepper. Some brave dentists in the 21st century tried it out, and it worked pretty well. Ground-up ash was also used in another recipe to create a tooth-cleansing paste. Mint was missing, so that didn't do much for their breath. That's when the genius Egyptians came up with the world's first breath mints. They made tablets from heated spices like cinnamon, and they mixed it with honey. Now, let's shift gears to home decor, Egyptian style. They surely took ornamentation to the next level. While the concept of decorating furniture started in Mesopotamia, the Egyptians cranked it up a notch. They went all out with different colors of ink and even developed various weights of paper. Oh, and let's not forget about those cute little area rugs we all have in our homes today. Guess who came up with the idea? Yep, the Egyptians. They used the versatile papyrus plant to make those cozy rugs. And speaking of trends, the Egyptians love their knickknacks. They had an assortment of small figurines in the shapes of cats, dogs, and people. These statues were made from various materials, like simple sun-dried mud to the ultimate bling of gold. It all depended on how loaded you were. The Egyptians were also all about farming, and they knew that clean water was crucial for their crops and animals. That's why they came up with some nifty inventions and techniques to make sure their land was fertile and their plants were happy. First off, they had the genius idea of using ox-drawn plows. They had two types of plows, heavy and light. The heavy plow would strut its stuff, cutting deep furrows in the soil, while the lighter plow followed behind, fluffing up the earth. But they didn't stop there. After plowing, the Egyptians would break up clumps of soil and sow the rows with seeds. To give those seeds a good old squish into the furrows, they'd march their livestock across the field, effectively closing up the furrows. But hey, all that hard work would be pointless if their seeds were as dry as the Sahara. That's where irrigation comes into play. The Egyptians were so good at it that other cultures, like the Greeks and Romans, couldn't help but copy their techniques. Now let's switch gears and talk about the marvelous architecture of ancient Egypt. These folks weren't just skilled farmers, they were also architectural maestros. They built these fancy canals to carry water to farms and villages, and boy, did they know how to make those canals look pretty. Just imagine strolling along a canal lined with ornate structures. The pharaoh Ramesses the Great was quite the overachiever when it came to construction. One of his mind-blowing creations was the construction located at Abu Simbel. This building was designed so that twice a year, the sun would shine directly into it and illuminate the statues of Ramesses. And let's not forget about the corbelled arch. Without this architectural gem, we'd be missing out on some mind-boggling structures like the Great Pyramid. The Egyptians knew how to make things stand tall and proud, thanks to their engineering and construction wizardry. They built grand halls and inner sanctums that make your jaw drop. And some of these temples doubled as astronomical observatories. The year is 2160. The place, the Pacific Ocean, off the coast of Japan. The ocean seems calm, at least the surface does. The ocean floor is cracking right now. Boom! The earth opens up, magma shoots out. The crack in the ocean floor triggers an earthquake, and a massive amount of energy shoots into the ocean. And now for gravity to get involved. It pulls the water down and makes it move faster and faster. It's a tsunami. A wave as high as a skyscraper plows toward Tokyo at 500 miles per hour. That's millions of tons of water. It would be awesome to take a picture of it, but there's no time to admire the power of nature. The tsunami's about to hit Tokyo Bay. The tsunami smashes ashore and starts attacking the largest structure on the planet, the Tokyo Pyramid Metropolis. It's 6,600 feet tall. That's five times the height of the Empire State Building. Imagine if the entire population of Denver, Colorado lived and worked in one building. 
the Tokyo Pyramid Metropolis TPM, can handle 750,000 people at a time. Incredibly, the structure withstands the impact, and most of the tsunami's energy seems to have just disappeared. This time, engineering stands up to nature. TPM was built by the Shimizu Corporation, which was founded in 1804. The pyramid is the most stable structure around. If you don't believe me, go to Egypt and see the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's lasted 4,500 years, and it's still going strong. The TPM is built on water and consists of 204 individual pyramids. They look like bunches of grapes stacked on top of each other, eight tiers in all. Only in this case, each grape is the size of a Vegas casino. The TPM's actually hollow. That's how it defends itself against typhoons and tsunamis. It doesn't meet the wind and waves head-on, but lets all that energy just pass right through it. Robots and autonomous control systems run this place. It runs on solar, wind, and wave energy. The pyramids are connected by passages, all in all about 85 miles worth. They connect everything and are maintained by AI that always finds you the fastest way to get from Pyramid A to Pyramid B. The TPA is obviously the city of the future, but human tech isn't quite ready for it just yet. Originally, engineers decided to install the pyramid on 36 columns, all dug into the ocean bed. If you build a pyramid that size out of steel and concrete, you'd be looking at 50 million tons of load press in on itself. The TPM would have collapsed under its own weight and imploded into the ocean. They needed something a thousand times lighter than concrete and stronger than steel. So what's this futuristic material? Look at this old guy. It's the first car on the planet with an internal combustion engine. It hit the road in 1885. And this is the first artificial satellite that humans launched into space. It only took an evolutionary blip to go from the first horseless carriage to our first flight into space. That TPM's not looking so ridiculous. Hey, we can do anything. The solution is carbon, and it's everywhere. It's the rod in your pencil and the diamond in your crown or ring or industrial drill. But we don't just need ordinary carbon, we need graphene. It's a type of carbon we can make nanotubes out of. They're thinner than a human hair, but 400 times stronger than steel. And most importantly, they're light. Nanotubes aren't affected by chemicals, oxygen, or water. Perfect for the TPM. That's just a fancy way of saying the thing's not going to rust. Shimizu has plans for a power station on the moon an underwater city, transforming the Sahara Desert into a huge oasis, and much more. But they aren't the only ones changing the planet. The Netherlands is the size of two New Jerseys, and about 30% of it is below sea level. To protect their country from water, the Dutch build dams, lots of them. But that's just defense. In 1986, they decided to go on offense and take back some of the land from the sea. The first dam was 19 miles long. It basically turned a bay into a lake. The second dam sealed the deal. After 42 years of work, the Netherlands got itself a whole new province larger than Los Angeles. Humans have done the same thing all over the world, like in Hong Kong, the Philippines, Italy. Hey, take that, water! What about building stuff on land that's already land? Before NASA's missions to Mars, the most expensive project in history was the construction of the interstate highway system in the United States. It took about 35 years to finish. In today's money, it cost about $530 billion. All that cash bought 46,000 miles of road. That's almost two times around the globe. There are over 270 million vehicles in the US, more than Japan, Brazil, India, and Germany combined. But in terms of sheer effort, the roads of Rome were way more impressive. Over 2,000 years before the first automobile, the Romans built a huge network of roads 50,000 miles long. They connected Ireland with Egypt and Turkey with Spain. The roads were pretty safe, and travelers could stay in hotels, dine in cafes, or mail a letter at the nearest post office. Only about 30% of the Earth's surface is land. 
The world's oceans, rivers, and lakes are full of life, and it seemed like a ridiculous task to catalog everything living in there. But 2,700 scientists from 80 countries decided to team up to do it. The cost? $650 million. Those scientists spent 10 years searching for old and new species. It was one of the biggest science projects ever attempted. They even discovered about 6,000 new species of fish, squid, and algae. The Great Wall of China is huge. 13,000 miles of walls, natural barriers, and trenches. That's about two times the distance from Alaska to Australia. They built it over a period of 2,000 years, with no trucks, bulldozers, electricity. Just raw people power. Modern China is not exactly dropping the ball. In two years, China used more concrete for construction than the U.S. ever did. I mean ever. Roads, cities, airports, everything there is huge. The Three Gorges Dam is definitely the new Great Wall of China. Over 7,600 feet long and 600 feet high. You're looking at three times more concrete and steel than the Hoover Dam. It's the largest concrete structure in the world and cost about $37 billion. More than a million people had to pack up and move to make way for it. Switzerland has the longest and deepest railway tunnel on the planet. Under the snowy Alps, builders dug 35 miles of tunnels. Every day, 200 freight and passenger trains pass through it. The amount of rock they took out to make the tunnel is about the same as five great pyramids. The whole thing cost about $12 billion. Egypt's one of the oldest nations on the planet. But now, they're building one of the newest cities. It's going to be about the size of Singapore and filled with 6 million lucky people. There's going to be apartments, government buildings, entertainment, even an opera house. Oh, and a park that'll make Central Park look like someone's backyard. When it's finished, it'll be Egypt's new capital. So why bother? Well, by 2050, Cairo's going to have about 40 million people in it. Looks like they'll need more than one new city. The first flights to the moon cost about $280 billion in today's money. But SpaceX isn't letting price get in its way. The company plans to build a colony on Mars with a population of 1 million by 2050. They claim that once the program starts, you'll be able to buy a ticket to Mars for as little as $100,000. But the biggest science project ever is definitely the International Space Station. It weighs as much as two Boeing 747s and zooms through space at the speed of 17,500 miles per hour. That pencils out to be 5 miles per second. The station orbits the Earth 16 times per day, and it doesn't come cheap. Luckily, a whole bunch of countries share the bill. But it's definitely the most expensive room service anywhere in the galaxy. It costs $10,000 to deliver a bottle of water from Earth to the space station. Hey, at that price, I think it's important to ask, sparkling or still? If someone finally invents time travel and you hop on a trip to the past, you won't recognize many of the things you know and love today. The Statue of Liberty and the Egyptian pyramids, some basic gadgets like the remote control and your laptop, and even the corn you have for lunch have all changed beyond recognition. When the pyramids were originally built in ancient Egypt and Giza and other places, they didn't look sandy brown at all. All of them were covered with white limestone. If you had seen them under the hot African sun, you'd have to look away. That's how smooth and shiny they were. Builders used around 6 million tons of this material for the Great Pyramid of Giza alone. It's the largest one you can still see on your trip to Egypt. The local rules were quite a thrifty crowd, and they reused some of the casing stones for other construction projects. A massive earthquake in the 14th century has also loosened some of the stones, so you won't see a lot of limestone, but some of it is still there, on top of the Pyramid of Hafre in Giza. It looks like it has a second peak on top of the first. In ancient times, all pyramids used to have capstones called pyramidians, covered in a mix of gold and silver. Most of them have been lost over the centuries, but you can still see a few of them at museums. They show images of Egyptian deities. The pyramids were probably modeled after a sacred pointed stone, the Benben. 
It represented the rays of the sun. Now, lifting heavy rocks wasn't so simple without the tech we have today. I guess you'll agree with me if you helped your friends move at least once, and they made you carry the couch. But those smart Egyptians of the past thought of that and chose the pyramid shape. It lets the weight distribute evenly throughout the whole thing. The Statue of Liberty has also had a major makeover since it was first unveiled in 1886. Believe it or not, it used to be a shiny brown color, just like a penny. 20 years later, it changed its color to green. It wasn't a fashion statement, but a chemical reaction. The statue is covered with hundreds of thin copper sheets. When copper reacts with air, it naturally forms a protective layer called vudigrees. This layer protects what's under it from corrosion, and that's why statues and other things made of copper, brass, and bronze can last so long. When Lady Liberty first turned green, people in authority decided it would be a good idea to paint it all over. It was way before social media, so you couldn't just drop an angry comment under the post describing the idea. But they wrote about it in the local newspapers, and the public didn't love the idea. Then the Times interviewed a copper and bronze manufacturer, and he confirmed they shouldn't repaint it, because removing the protective layer would mean destroying the statue. Over the years, people have suggested painting Lady Liberty several times, but no one has ever done it. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine that lady in any other color, so I guess it's for the better. You love bananas as much as I do? Next time you enjoy a juicy soft one, remember you gotta thank Selective Breeding for that texture. The original wild bananas had many large, hard seeds and not so much delicious pulp. And hey, who doesn't like a sugary watermelon? It has a history of over 5,000 years, and it used to have bitter, yellowish-white flesh and was really tricky to open. Selective breeding saved the day again, and watermelons got way sweeter. Japanese scientists went further and invented the seedless version. Corn's grandmother is a Mexican grass called Teosinti. The kernels in this grass were small and hard to get. Farmers from many thousands of years ago saved the seeds only of those plants that were larger or tastier or with kernels that were easier to grind. Thanks, my friends, for giving us the corn that's edible and even delicious. And just imagine, wild avocados were so small that they could easily fit in the palm of your hand. The pit in them was so large, you wouldn't find much edible material inside. They also had a much harder shell than the ones we're used to. You probably wouldn't get a lot of work done without your beloved computer today, but I can't tell you exactly whom to thank for this invention. The ABC from 1942 is one of the contendants for the title of the first computer. It's short for the Atanasoff Berry Computer named after its inventors at Iowa State University. The ABC weighed over 700 pounds. Yep, yours must be way lighter than that. That big boy consisted of around 300 vacuum tubes and had a rotating drum, a little bigger than a paint can, and had small capacitors on it. A capacitor is a gadget that can store an electric charge, like a battery. The ABC could solve problems with up to 29 different variables to help scientists save some time. Like modern computers, it used binary digits, ones and zeros, to represent all numbers and data. Because of that, it was possible to do the calculations electronically. And now, my favorite part, the ABC finished one operation about every 15 seconds. Just for you to compare, it's millions of operations per second now. Unlike the tech we use today, the ABC did not have a changeable stored program. So the program could only do a single task at a time. An operator had to write down the intermediate answer and then dial that back into the computer. Sounds like another reason to be happy we live in the 21st century. That remote control you use for all sorts of appliances has gone a long way too. Nikola Tesla, who gave us alternating current, designed one of the first wireless remote controls back in 1898. 
He named his invention Teleautomation and demonstrated it on a miniature boat controlled by radio waves. The boat had a little metal antenna attached to it. Tesla sent signals to the boat using a box with a lever and a telegraph key, which was his version of a remote control. Those signals set electrical contacts on the boat into motion and moved the rudder and the propeller, and Tesla was controlling the boat. The concept of the remote control soon spread to other gadgets. The first television remote control followed in 1950. It was designed by the Zenith Radio Corporation called Lazy Bone. Don't take it personally, please. This Lazy Bone had a massive cable that was attached to the TV set, and those who tried it didn't fall in love with the invention because they tripped over that cord. I feel your pain, my friends. If you live or work on one of the top floors, you gotta love this one. Meet the first passenger elevator. It traveled at the speed of 40 feet per minute. Not the fastest, I know, compared to today's record, which is 40 feet per second. But hey, it was built back in 1857 in New York and was more of a tourist attraction than a necessity. The elevator had a steam engine hidden in the basement of a five-story building. Three years later, they shut it down because the public didn't appreciate it. Otis Tufts filed the first patent for a vertical railway around the same time. His invention included an actual car with a bench inside for people to sit on. Sounds like a great spot to hang out with friends to me. What do you say? Then they started adding elevators to luxurious hotels around the world. They were entire rooms with a rich design, upholstered seats and mirrors on the walls, and sometimes even a small chandelier. There was an obligatory operator who'd close the door and the car would start its super slow ascent. It was still more about style than about speed, so I guess I'd choose the stairs. The ancient city of Taposiris Magna is hidden on the northern coast of Egypt. These days it has very little of its former glory, but what lies beneath it may hold the secret to uncovering a famous mystery, that of Cleopatra the most memorable Egyptian queen in history. The recently discovered tunnel is also known as a geometric miracle for its time. Excavations have uncovered a 43-foot-long structure below the ground, which is partially submerged in water. Its shape and construction technique are similar to that of the Eupolinos Tunnel, another amazing ancient discovery. This one is located in Greece and was built by excavating simultaneously from two points aiming to have them meet in the middle. The use of math and geometry to make this construction was astonishingly precise for those days, more so since it was built near a mountain. Archaeologists that have been working on the Taposiris Magna site since 2004 believe this tunnel may lead to the lost tomb of Cleopatra. The clues they found so far seem to back up this theory. For starters, the city and its temple were built by one of Cleopatra's ancestors, Ptolemy II. All the architecture seems to indicate it was dedicated to the ancient spirit Osiris and his queen Isis. Throughout her reign, Cleopatra did try to associate herself with Isis, so it may be no surprise she chose this location as her final resting place. Scientists have yet to pinpoint Cleopatra's tomb, but research continues with the help of modern technology. To study this location better, archaeologists have even used a special device called ground-penetrating radar. This tool allows us to analyze what lies beneath the ground without being intrusive. Since this tunnel is so old, research needs to be done very delicately. Seeing pictures of what's underground before you start digging is incredibly useful and has been done here since 2011. Finally discovering Cleopatra's tomb may help us piece together her story, especially what might have happened during the last portion of her life, which is still surrounded by mystery. We still don't know the exact cause of her passing. Some believe she may have let herself be bitten by a poisonous Egyptian cobra. Others have suggested that she was well accustomed to toxic substances, even hiding some in her hairbrush in case she ever needed it but that's not to say she chose to use it on herself. We do have a lot of other interesting information on Cleopatra that's equally as impressive. 
like the fact that she had a stylist. Most of the images you've seen depicting this famous queen show her wearing black eyeliner. This look was put together by Ayras, a woman known to have been her personal beautician. She traced the long line from her eyes to her temples, a makeup technique still used today to enhance the eyes. Ayras was an important figure throughout Cleopatra's life, known also as her confidant and close friend. There are even theories that suggest Ayras was there by her side when she passed away. Despite her well-thought-out looks, Cleopatra wasn't as pretty as she's described. Or at least, that's what recent research has pointed out. Sure, if we look at movies and modern imagery, she's depicted as this incredibly beautiful woman with symmetrical and delicate features. However, if we look at coins showcasing her image from back in the day, her looks are rather average. Her image on the coins might have been adjusted too to make the queen look stronger in the eyes of her people. So there is no trusted source available to confirm her image, but her description in most pieces of ancient literature speaks of her other qualities, like her voice and personality, not of her beauty. Cleopatra might have been the most famous Egyptian queen to this day, but she wasn't the first choice. She did have an older sister, Berenice, that was initially supposed to take the throne. Berenice passed away before she could do that, so Cleopatra took on the role and began investing in her education. She traveled throughout the country quite frequently, so she could become accustomed to her people and their needs. She was only 18 when the responsibilities were passed down to her and immediately gained popularity because of her intelligence and education. Her taste in literature was quite good too. She was known to be a fan of Homer, the famed Greek philosopher and poet. Cleopatra loved to write as much as she loved to read. There are even claims that she wrote a book on medicine and cosmetics, but we have no evidence to this day that such work ever existed. Part of being a great leader back then meant you had to speak multiple languages. Cleopatra clearly understood that, and that's why she's rumored to have known many languages to varying degrees. Some archaeologists suggested she spoke Greek, Egyptian, and Ethiopian, as well as many Arabic dialects. She might have even spoken Latin, but there's little evidence to support this claim. She might not have had angelic looks, but Cleopatra was really careful with the way she looked, even with her diet. She was known to have enjoyed simple meals, including a variety of fish. Since she lived close to the Mediterranean Sea, it's really no surprise. As a treat, she liked to eat stuffed pigeons, which she also served to her guests. Other dishes on the menu included vegetables and fava bean soup. Fruits and nuts weren't missing from her diet either, and she was also a big fan of honey. Recently, a team of experts has even tried to recreate her famous perfume. Think of it like the ancient equivalent of Chanel No. 5. Cleopatra was known to be a fan of luxurious scents, which she believed could even influence how people treated her when they met. The basis of this scent is myrrh, a resin gathered from a local tree. Other ingredients added to the mixture were also found back in the day, like cardamom, olive oil, and cinnamon. The results may not be quite as delicate as the perfumes we know and use today. Its consistency was way thicker, and the scent lasted way longer. When she was at the height of her power, Cleopatra might have been the richest person in the world. Back in the day, she ruled over a territory that stretched across the Mediterranean, from modern-day Libya in the west through Egypt to Syria in the east. This is the largest territory ever ruled over by a woman. In today's currency, her worth might have been somewhere around $95 billion. The calendars we use today may have been introduced by Cleopatra herself. She presented the idea of leap years and leap days to Caesar, the Roman emperor she was known to have been close with. Taking her advice, Caesar made these adjustments part of the official Roman calendar. The ancient Egyptians already knew the year was longer than precisely 365 days. They discovered this by studying the brightest star in the sky, called Sirius, 
and concluded that a year is actually 365 and one quarter days long. It was Elizabeth Taylor that famously introduced Cleopatra to pop culture when she played her in the 1963 film bearing the same name. Up until that point, it was the most expensive film ever made. It was originally supposed to cost somewhere around $2 million, but ended up costing a mind-boggling $44 million. That's mostly because of script and production issues. To make this iconic movie, producers created 79 sets from scratch, as well as over 26,000 costumes for the cast. Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra costumes alone cost somewhere around $200,000. Thankfully for the producers, the movie made headlines and was well received by critics, making it a box office success. A lot of people associate Cleopatra with another famous Egyptian ruler, King Tutankhamun, nicknamed King Tut. Surprisingly, apart from both of them being Egyptian pharaohs, they have nothing else in common. For starters, King Tut lived around 1300 years before Cleopatra did, and there is also no connection regarding their ancestry. Cleopatra had Macedonian Greek roots, while King Tut was a native Egyptian. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery, so there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang, which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know, the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. 
So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. One of the most unexplored and mysterious places on Earth is located in plain sight. It's one of the most majestic monuments of humankind. The wonder of the ancient world hides a secret that scientists and archaeologists still can't solve. This is the Great Sphinx of Giza in Egypt. The huge sculpture of a lion with a human head was carved out of rock about four and a half thousand years ago. Scientists still don't know the exact date of its creation and are also unaware of who built it and what for. There are many assumptions and theories, but none of them has been confirmed. Most people have seen this majestic sculpture either in photographs or in reality, but almost no one knows what's hidden underneath it. The statue of the Sphinx was carved from a single piece of limestone. It was painted. The remains of color pigment on the surface prove this. In the distant past, the Sphinx looked much brighter and more colorful than what we see now. But even after thousands of years, its greatness hasn't diminished. And by the way, Sphinx is not the real name. It was invented by the Greeks about a hundred years or more after its creation. Initially, the Egyptians called the statue hor em -Akit. There are many legends and theories saying the Sphinx is there for a reason. It's like a watchdog that guards the tomb of the pharaoh and the secrets of ancient Egypt. These legends become more plausible when archaeologists discovered hidden entrances at the feet of the Sphinx. They believe that these secret passages are the beginning of the tunnels leading to the halls with treasures. You can find a lot of stories on the internet that claim the Sphinx hides the Hall of Records, a repository filled with ancient and secret knowledge. One of the main artifacts of this repository is supposed to be the records of the ancient mythical state of Atlantis. According to legends, the entire library from this city was moved under the Sphinx. The entrance to this library must be located next to the Sphinx's right paw. Many archaeologists tried to find this entrance, but came away empty-handed. Also, there are many images with detailed diagrams of the underground city that consists of a network of tunnels and chambers under the Sphinx. Someone says there are structures as tall as 12-story buildings hiding underground, but there's no evidence of this. Archaeologists, even after millennia, continue to explore the mysterious sculpture. At the same time, Many Egyptians don't want to learn more about the Sphinx. They're terrified of awakening something supernatural. In 1998, scientists discovered tunnels leading to empty caves under the Sphinx. They found evidence of earlier excavations there. It's quite possible that someone managed to find the treasures and take them away. Some people believe Egyptians found some kind of artifact under the Sphinx that has the power of unknown advanced technologies. The artifact is so powerful that it can change the course of history. Of course, most theories are just fairy tales of conspiracy fans, but it's a confirmed fact that the Sphinx hides a system of caves and rooms. There are so many rumors surrounding the Sphinx that it's impossible to understand what's true and what's false. In any case, it's difficult and dangerous to study the sculpture because active excavations can destroy it. And then the entrance to the underground rooms can get blocked by rocks and lost forever. Also, further exploration requires a lot of money and financing is not always easy to find. But the main reason? It's too risky. There's no guarantee that people will be able to get out of the underground labyrinths. For these reasons, scientists and archaeologists have been exploring this majestic structure for so long. Another famous architectural monument with a secret is Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Everyone admires the images of the U.S. president's faces carved into the rock, but few people know that there's a secret room hidden behind the head of Abraham Lincoln. The architect of Mount Rushmore wanted to carve slabs on the rock with the record of the main stages of the country's history. But his plan was too complicated to carry out. 
Then he was offered to implement it on a much smaller scale, to build a secret room inside the mountain. The idea was to save this knowledge so that future generations will always remember the history of their country. Unfortunately, the architect didn't have time to finish his work. The construction stopped for several decades. But in the late 90s, the project was resumed. Porcelain enamel panels depicting the history of the U.S. were placed in the room. It's possible that these plates will be stored there forever. But people can't see them, at least for now. The room is inaccessible to tourists, as it's too difficult to get inside. Another secret room is located in the Empire State Building. More precisely, it's not even a room, but a place where you can take cool photos. Almost all tourists gather on the observation deck of the 86th floor to enjoy a stunning view of Manhattan. But there's another deck with panoramic windows on the 102nd floor. There are way fewer people there because almost no one knows about that place. Fortunately, access to this deck is open to everyone. You probably won't have to wait in line for a long time to take a photo. You'll feel special because you're in such a secret place where there are almost no people. But the coolest place is even higher, on the 103rd floor. This is a spacious observation deck where celebrities get their photographs taken. It's not a public place, but if you know the right people, you can get there. There are almost no security measures on the site. Only a low ledge between you and an abyss. That's why crowds of people are forbidden from coming here. It's not so easy to get there. And you're unlikely to succeed without a guide. First, you need to choose the right elevator that will take you there. Then you'll go through several engineering rooms filled with pipes, electrical panels, and other technical stuff. The final part of your way is a set of stairs inside a tiny corridor. And here you are, at the top of New York. Now we're in Paris. <laughs> See the Eiffel Tower? Inside it, there are restaurants and observation decks. But if you try hard, you can find a secret apartment. Now it's a museum, but it was built so that people could live in it. The architect of the tower, Gustav Eiffel, created this apartment in 1889 for himself. It's almost at the very top of the Eiffel Tower. Imagine what a beautiful view he observed every day. He was the first and only tenant. No one else could gain access to this place. When the architect passed away, the apartment remained empty for a long time. Only recently, they restored it and turned it into a museum. Inside, the epoch of the last century is recreated. They even put wax figures of Gustav Eiffel, his daughter, and the American inventor Thomas Edison inside the room. This place is filled with an endless stream of passengers, office workers running late, visitors from other cities, noise, and train whistles. At Grand Central Station in New York, among all these sounds, you can hear the sound of a ball hitting a racket, if you're in the right place. A real tennis court is hidden inside New York Central Station. It belongs to a tennis club that arranges corporate games for employees of many companies. The club was opened in the 60s. Now we're moving to London, Charing Cross Road. It isn't easy to find one secret place here. To do this, you need to look carefully at your feet. Do you see these sewer grates in the asphalt? Inside them, you can notice two signs with the name Little Compton Street. Yeah, there's another street right below you. It disappeared from all maps at the end of the 19th century. Charing Cross Road was built over it. The identification signs that you see are part of old engineering tunnels. There's another interesting place in London. It's located in the southeast corner of Trafalgar Square. At first glance, it looks like a thick lamppost, but there are too many tourists walking around. You come closer and realize that one person can easily fit inside the post. The lamppost belongs not to an electrician, but to a police officer. Yeah, this is the smallest police station in the world. It was built in the 1930s and used as a watch post. 
officers had to sit there one by one and watch Trafalgar Square that always attracted a lot of pickpockets and all kinds of other criminals. Listen to this. Neanderthal fiber technology. Nope, I'm not joking. The concept is real. In 2020, a team of scientists published a paper that redefined the way we saw our closest ancestors. A find in France changed archaeology forever, and it wasn't the first time something like this had happened. But let me start from the beginning. Neanderthals. For a long time, they fit the image of the typical cavemen. If you are now thinking of someone like Fred Flintstone, you wouldn't be much wrong. What was the reason behind this stereotype? When did we start believing that Neanderthals were not the brightest tools in the shed of evolution? In comes William King, a 19th century British geologist. He was the man who named the Neanderthals. Based on the bones King found, the scientist declared the species not intelligent, and this image stuck with the Neanderthals for centuries to come. But a piece of string, just a quarter of an inch long, changed everything. A small, dry river valley, Abri Dumaras, was the place of the great find. Archaeologists unearthed a cord fragment next to a stone tool. Such twisted fibers could have been used for everything from making clothes to fishing nets. In prehistory, this was some advanced tech, and the Neanderthals seemed to have mastered it. Scientists already knew that these early humans made tar from birch bark, and that they produced shell beads. There's even evidence of Neanderthal art. They were definitely not primitive. The string section and similar finds are changing the way we perceive our ancestors. The world of archeology span is constantly changing. Take the pyramids in Egypt, for example. Turns out they weren't really built by an army of people who the Pharaoh made work until they passed out. Herodotus, the famous Greek historian, was the man who started the confusion. He claimed, in 500 BCE, that 100,000 men took part in the construction of the Great Pyramid in Giza. He made no mention of who they were and why they were building the pyramids. That's how the myth started. Huge stone slabs pulled by humans, driven by a foreman with a whip. But Egyptologists would beg to differ. Those are the scientists who study ancient Egypt's culture. Fairly recently, they uncovered a worker's village that told a different tale. Yes, there was evidence of hard work on the workers' bones, but the construction industry is demanding even today. It took almost six years for 12,000 workers to complete the world's tallest building, Burj Khalifa. Back in Egypt, three times more workers finished the Great Pyramid in around two decades. An impressive feat of ancient engineering, wouldn't you agree? Superiors looked well after the Egyptians who built the pyramids. Their diet was rich in protein. They had medical care and they got paid properly. In fact, they lived better than the non-working population. And they lived with their families near the construction site. Archaeologists know all this because they unearthed bakeries and dormitories with bread jars and other goodies. Looks like the pharaohs were okay employers after all. And the job market wasn't that terrible. They also kept detailed papyrus records of the build and hieroglyphs you and I wouldn't stand a chance of reading these letters that resemble images. Egyptologists had the same problem. For over a millennium, no one had used this type of font. And it's not like there was an English ancient Egyptian dictionary you could open and find meanings of words. But all this changed in 1822. A couple of decades before, the French found a broken slab of black granite. The stone contained one text and three scripts, ancient Greek, Egyptian hieroglyphs, and Demotic. The last one was also the Egyptian language, but in a simplified script. Scientists dated it back to 196 BCE. The content is a religious proclamation. A French philologist and orientalist, Jean-Francois Champollion, was the first one to crack the code. You see, people haven't forgotten ancient Greek letters. The Frenchman successfully matched the Greek letters with the ones in the Egyptian script. And voila, we were finally able to read hieroglyphs. The name of the piece of granite that made it all possible was the Rosetta Stone.
The importance of its discovery went beyond archaeology. The word Rosetta Stone even entered the English dictionary. It represents a discovery that helps people understand an enigma that has been puzzling them for a long time. There are similar games. A symbol is attached to a particular message. Then you have to decode the message by replacing the symbol with a corresponding letter. In a nutshell, this is what scientists did with the Rosetta Stone more than two centuries ago. Do you know what is the oldest deciphered language in Europe? It has an unattractive name, Linear B. The script belongs to the Mycenaean Greek language. It predates the ancient Greek alphabet by several centuries. You can easily guess which script it is descended from. Linear A. The people from Crete used Linear B more than a thousand years ago. During the Late Bronze Age, the Greek civilization that used the script vanished. There was no one who could read Linear B, and more importantly, no one knew it existed in the first place. This was about to change during the first years of the 20th century. A British archaeologist by the name of Sir Arthur Evans excavated a vast palace complex at Knossos, Crete, Greece. This was the center of the Minoan culture that created the enigmatic script. The palace boasted some 1,300 rooms. They had colorful paintings of dolphins, griffins, and bulls. All of these captivated the archaeologists' imagination. But their biggest find was at first overlooked. Thousands of slabs of baked clay. The fire that brought down the palace helped preserve the tablets. It was impossible to read the slabs, though. They were written in an unknown language. The scientific community had to wait for another half a century before Michael Ventris cracked the code. He was an English architect and cryptographer. Ventris studied Greek and Latin. While attending the famous archaeologist's lecture, the young man decided to solve the puzzle of Linear B once and for all. He managed to do so in 1952. One of Ventris's most amazing discoveries was that the script was an archaic form of Greek but cryptology still hasn't solved the code of Linear A. This writing system will remain a mystery until a motivated young person like Michael Ventris comes along. They wouldn't have to be a professional archeologist. Basil Brown certainly wasn't. Yet in 1939, he discovered the richest early medieval tomb in Europe. This happened in Sutton Hoo in the southeast of England. This wasn't an ordinary tomb made out of stone. It was a full-size ship three times as long as a London double-decker bus. And that's not all. Apart from its main purpose, the ship was full of riches. Deluxe hanging bowls, feasting vessels, golden dress accessories, and luxurious textiles were just some of the treasures found. Archaeologists were also amazed by the silverware from distant Byzantium. You probably know this city as Istanbul, Turkey. Even in our age, it's several days' drive from Sutton Hoo. Just imagine how much time and money it cost to import a silver plate in the 7th century. That's when the ship went down, according to archaeologists. The English couldn't have done it. At that time, there was no England. The people living in the British Isles at the time were the Anglo-Saxons. Perhaps the ship from the grassy mounds in Suffolk belonged to one of their kings? We will never know. The local acidic soil did away with any possible evidence or no one laid there in the first place. It could have been a cenotaph, which is a monument constructed to honor an important person. The archaeologists still don't have a definite answer. But what they have found at Sutton Hoo shed light on the Dark Ages. Before the discovery of the ship, they knew little about what had been going on in Britain after the Romans left. Now, the image of the early Anglo-Saxon society was much clearer. Perhaps the English soil will be the site of the next great breakthrough in archaeology.